Dr. Tommy Curry, how are you? I'm great, sir. How are you? Great. What are we talking about today? Today I want to talk about Richard uh, Sherman the thug image. Let's do it. All right. So, look, there's a real crisis here, Rob. Uh, there's a crisis that keeps making the job of black intellectuals reactive, and there's a crisis where black people uh, look at stereotypes, become emotional, but don't understand the motivations and power behind them. Uh, you know, for academics, it's like we're the moral police. You know, we get on our Facebook accounts, we send out blogs, we, you know, put on our, our YouTube channels and, and video chats, and we try to correct the morality of the world. We try to become famous based on our commentaries. You know, so we're the PhDs to the rescue. Uh, what we were seeing on Twitter, uh, people are saying that not only is Sherman a thug, uh, but he's a nigger. Uh, you can take the nigger out of the hood, but you can't take the nigger out of the nigger. And this is not simply ignorance. Uh, I've been frustrated by seeing time and time again where we've attacked this for racism, we've attacked this for uh, ignorance, how unfair it is. This is an attack on the humanity of black men. And by effect, and an extension of that is an attack on black people. Uh, this is Sylvia Winters' No Humans Evolved, uh, where she states that the humanity of black men are voided. Uh, black men have to be made into something else so that they can be killed without remorse. This is the boys, right? You teach the world that the one virtue is to be white, and they rush to the evil conclusion of kill the nigger. We're not watching the stereotypes of white people. We're watching the racial logic of white people unfold before us. Richard Sherman is an example of what happens when a black man steps out of line, when he breaks etiquette, when he breaks roll call, when he is no longer silent and quiet and in uniform, right? It's not, you know, and even when you watch his interview where he said, well, look, perhaps this is misguided. I was like, we, we, we see this because we police ourselves, right? We police ourselves and we know the rules, but every time these types of things happen, this isn't about what rules we break. This is about the vulnerability of our humanity that could be taken away from us at any moment, right? Richard Sherman is is Jonathan Farrell. He's the person that's allowed to live. Jonathan Farrell was an educated man, a citizen, but he was treated as a criminal and defined as a thug. Right? So when when you call a black man a nigger, right, when you see this thug imagery, when you define him as a criminal, historically this has always been a way to justify the lynching of him, to justify his castration, right? This is the cutting off of his penis and parading around to society to let you know that you can never ever have a black man that stands for anything but what white people tell them for. Tell them that they are, right? So this is where their humanity is erased from the slate and they're left vulnerable to racist hate. And what we've done is we've continued to pretend that there's no consequence to these types of stereotypes. You know, I've said it before, this is what angers me about the way black academics and black people as a whole try to approach these type of issues. We pretend that this that this racism can be remedied through language and education, right? But this is the, what we're witnessing is a logic here. We're witnessing how white people see black male bodies, and these black male bodies are killed. Which ensures response while eloquent to being called a thug does not disprove the stereotype. And while we're going around celebrating the fact that he eloquently refuted this idea and showed that, you know, he has education in class, what he does, what he in reality shows is that any black man, despite his education, despite his class, despite his station in life, his fame or his intellect, is vulnerable to death. They can, they can create whatever image they want of black men. They can do whatever they want to black men. This man is famous. This man is a, it is a, it is a, it is a, it is a NFL CB. And it doesn't matter because the same type of visceral hate and racism that the public is willing to put on his body is still looked at as, as if it's legitimate, right? This is what this type of ideology of killing him, of calling him a thug, of justifying this criminalization is what justifies killing the mothers that reproduce and birth these thugs. It's the idea that you can kill the black women that breed this type of pathology. So we must not become so reliant on reason and discourse, on sharing blogs on Facebook, that we become blind to the realities that generate the stories for this type of Internet activism, namely the deaths of black men and destruction of the communities that these people come from. He represents someone who's successfully escaped these types of conditions. But what white America is trying to show us is that they will never look at black men as not having those conditions within them. No matter how successful, no matter how educated they become, they will always be seen as an extension of the types of pathologies that white people believe fundamentally exist in these types of communities and these types of pathologies that are birthed from the womb of our black women. Until we get on board with this and understand the logic of this and stop trying to negotiate these stereotypes as if they could be corrected, we will never understand that the types of violence that are being put on other black people who don't have the type of popularity or power as, as Sherman will never be addressed. Those people are dying. Those people are being killed. And we're up here sharing blogs about it. Unacceptable. Well said, Dr. Tommy Curry. How can folks get in contact with you? They get me on Twitter at Dr. TJC. Context of white supremacy. Justice. Gus T. Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of racism, white supremacy. Today's date, 
Thursday, January 30th, 2014, so I have been told. Uh, we should be back tomorrow, our seventh installment. Nelson Mandela, Madiba, his autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom. I think tomorrow we should hit the halfway point. Halfway point. I'm not celebrating, but uh, <laughs> meager accomplishments. I am uh, I am pleased. Like I said, I really I had uh, concerns uh, about participation. Uh, this is a book club. I want active participation. And I know for longer books, sometimes people, uh, their attention wanes as the book proceeds and people <clears throat> either miss a session so they don't feel that they can catch up and continue to follow along. But uh, I think the participation has been great. We even had folks uh, who wrote in responses uh, who were not able to participate in last week's session. Uh, very much looking forward. And I'm just pleased. I think might even come up today in our topic about racism in sports. Uh, might even come up today in one of the other reasons why I'm glad to uh, be studying the book. I uh, also have been reviewing the original manuscript uh, this week for Long Walk to Freedom. And there are notable, uh, really, I would say astronomical edits that took place between the original manuscript, or at least what is reported to be the original manuscript, and the final edition uh, that we have been reviewing thus far. But that's tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Tune in, participate, looking forward. Broadcast for today's program, uh, if folks remember, I believe September, uh, one of our investors, Bruce Fine, uh, she found the report, Mackenzie Ryan, white woman, uh, where she researched many of the, I can't even really say startling, uh, really it should be obvious, uh, parallels between fantasy football, which is dominated by white people, mostly white males, but they're all, she's a white female, so, uh, but mostly white men, uh, fantasy football, uh, and the parallels to slavery, racism, white supremacy, really interesting uh, report that she put together. She was with us in September to discuss that, uh, just some of the things that she observed in her research and just, she said, being a football fan, things that she sees, uh, hears on a regular basis, uh, just being around other white people when they are watching football games, participating in these contests. Uh, from that report, she <clears throat> recommended one of her professors who helped her with her research uh, and who also did quite a bit of his own writing on racism in sports. She thought he would be great to have on the program. I uh, contacted him way back when she was a guest on the program this past autumn. And he said he's still working. His his book is not complete. He said he'd be down to come and chat with us uh, once he finishes up his book. Uh, but to get back with him down the road and uh, see if he had time and was all done. I contacted him after everything happened with Richard Sherman uh, last week, uh, where the Super Bowl has now become a great platform to talk about racism. Contacted him again to see you know, if we could get him on the program to discuss his work as well as what happened with Mr. Sherman. And he said he was still still working on it. Ways to go, uh, but definitely stay in touch and uh, he'll be down to come and chat with us once he's done. But he reached out and said, I will see if I can help. Uh, he said one of his colleagues that he could recommend might be able to offer uh, some of his views. Uh, he has also written on this subject and he thought he would be great to have on the program. Uh, to get some of his thoughts on the intersection between athletics, racism, uh, not always something with regards to presidents, elected officials, statutes, laws, prison terms. Uh, racism is not always expressed in those uh, common fields. Uh, really, it's all areas of people activity. Uh, and I've said consistently for folks, if you have people, maybe even younger folks, uh, if they are not interested in racism. It's not something that they think about. They don't think it's a big deal. Uh, if they are interested in athletics or television, sometimes that can be a way to get them to kind of rethink uh, about racism and whether or not it has any relevance for them. This might be one such broadcast for such a young person or maybe even an older person who's not thinking or that concerned about racism. Uh, our guest for today's broadcast, uh, the book that he authored, Kurt Flood in the media. Very interesting title, even though I am no 
baseball fan. I'll make sure I get that out in the open. Uh, I really was not that informed about Kurt Flood because I am not a baseball fan, uh, but lots of interesting information uh, that goes beyond baseball and just gets to racism and athletics in general. Uh, the full title, Kurt Flood in the Media, Baseball, Race, and the Demise of the Activist Athlete. Quite an interesting title and uh, should give some interesting context uh, for what has happened with Richard Sherman, as well as the other incidents uh, that have taken with uh, taking place with some of the more popular uh, athletes, even something that happened pretty recently with Serena Williams. Uh, our guest is a assistant professor at the University of South Florida. He holds a joint appointment in the Department of Communications and the Department of Africana Studies. Uh, his research interests are rhetoric, social justice, and history of sports. We'll be grand to have him on the broadcast, get his views on his book, as well as some of these other incidents. Real pleasure to have him with us this evening. Joining us live, our guest, Dr. Abraham Khan. Uh, I'm checking the phone line, trying to multitask. Oh, I see him. Dr. Khan, are you with us, sir? Hello. Greetings. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for sharing a bit of your time with us, Dr. Khan. Um, for folks who might not be familiar with your book, this might be their first time hearing from you. Uh, any information that you think listeners would be helpful for them to know about you before we get started? Oh, uh, not in particular. Um, I mean, it's a, uh, well, first of all, the book is available on Amazon. So uh, feel free to buy it. Uh, it's a book about a man named Kurt Flood. And I suppose uh, knowing a little bit about the Kurt Flood story would help to put the book in context um, and uh, um, help to make sense of some of the conclusions that the book reaches. Um, the, uh, for listeners who don't know, Kurt Flood was a baseball player um, in the major leagues um, from 1960 to 1969. Uh, he played for the St. Louis Cardinals. Um, he uh, uh, played his entire career at St. Louis Cardinals. He was a terrific ball player in 1968, in fact. Sports Illustrated put him on the cover of the magazine and called him the best center fielder in baseball, which is also sort of a little bit of a swipe at Willie Mays, whose career was about to uh, come to an end. Um, and uh, he made a number of all-star teams. He was part of the World Series winning teams in 1964 and 1967. He also played in the World Series uh, in 1968 when the uh, St. Louis Cardinals lost to the Detroit Tigers. Um, but uh, what's most interesting about Kurt Flood uh, is that he was traded from the Cardinals to the Philadelphia Phillies at the end of the 1969 season. The Cardinals had a disappointing year. Um, the ownership was trying to shake things up a bit. Uh, and Kurt Flood uh, also had sort of a personality that didn't exactly agree with, um, the, uh, with the owner's view of the world. Uh, and so they decided to trade him, and after sp having spent his entire, basically his entire professional life in St. Louis, he didn't want to go to Philadelphia. Not only was Philadelphia a bad team, uh, but they were also uh, well-known for being kind of a dysfunctional organization and having racist fans. And so uh, he ultimately sued Major League Baseball in federal court, arguing that they had violated antitrust laws um, because he was, he was tied to the St. Louis organization through a contract provision known as the Reserve Clause. And back then, there was no such thing as free agency in sports, um, or at least the, no such thing as free agency in baseball. Every time a baseball player signed a contract for a year, he signed a contract, or he basically agreed to play for the same team the following year, uh, unless, of course, he was traded. Um, and so uh, he, he argued in federal court uh, that this book, from an antitrust act, and that it was. Oh, uh, you are breaking up a little bit. Okay, Sorry? we can hear. Uh, you were breaking up for a few seconds, but I think we can hear you okay now. Oh, well, I could hear you okay now. I'm not hearing you at all. Dr. Khan, are you there? Oh, looks like his line dropped out. Hopefully, he will. Uh, get back to us. Let's see. Uh, one sec. I will check to see if he 
gets back on the line. Um, hopefully, uh, as he we wait for him to dial back in, uh, just really quickly. If folks do not know who Kurt Flood is, uh, I did not. I'm sure you can check online to get some of that information. Uh, would probably be a good thing, uh, someone that you should know. And I think this is someone, I hear his name getting mentioned from time to time when people talk about athletes, uh, particularly when they are lamenting athletes not speaking up against racism, uh, when they mention people like Muhammad Ali, Arthur Ashe, Kurt Flood's name will generally get mentioned in that list. But I think Dr. Khan should be back with us. Uh, Dr. Khan, we lost you for a second, but I think we have you back now. Dr. Khan, are you with us? Oh, not hearing. Uh, Dr. Khan, you I'm here. Can you oh, hear okay. me? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. All right. Good deal. Uh, I've, I've, I'm, I'm not sure where I left off. I was sort of rambling about Kurt Flood. Um, I was uh, I was explaining that that when Kurt Flood was traded, he he sued Major League Baseball. Uh, one of the arguments that he made is that uh, baseball had violated the Thirteenth Amendment's prohibition of involuntary servitude. But the most interesting thing that Kurt Flood did was appear on national television and call himself a, a well-paid slave. Well, this angered many people. And so the book basically reviews the way in which uh, newspapers, uh, the sports media, uh, I take a very close look at black newspapers, uh, and the way that his case was covered by his contemporaries, and the way his case was framed as both a racial issue and, an, and a non-racial issue. Outstanding summary of the book. Uh, we will get into some of those issues uh, and hopefully draw some parallels between what you write about in your book and some of the uh, very recent incidents of athletes, race becoming major issues. Um, first of all, Dr. Khan, are, are you a classified, are you classified, accepted as a white person or a non-white person? Well, um, that, that depends on who you ask. Uh, I suppose if I uh, if I go home to my dad's house in Chicago, uh, my dad is a Pakistani immigrant. When I go home to my dad's house, I'm the white kid. But when I go to my mom's house here in Florida, uh, my mom's a, a white woman from Ohio. Uh, I'm the brown kid. So it really depends. Wow, that is fascinating. Uh, I guess generally speaking, like when you when you're at the University of uh, South Florida. Uh, other your other white colleagues or white students, do they accept you? Do they think of you as a white person or a non-white person? Well, they certainly address me. I would, I suppose, the way that they address uh, other, um, uh, you know, other white faculty and and my white colleagues. But um, it's also the case that uh, um, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I guess my my relationship with my students is different than my relationship with my colleagues. My relationship with my colleagues is different than uh, my relationship that I have, I would say, with closer friends on campus and in other professional spaces. So, I mean, the, I guess the, um, the, the, the short answer to your question is, I don't know, but I suppose. Hmm. You suppose they accept you as a white person? Yeah. Hmm. Do they ever ask any uh, questions like, where are you from, or... Where are your parents from? Do they ask any questions like that that may try to get at your uh, more information about your racial classification? Yeah, I mean, people uh, often try to fix my position. I remember one time I was, uh, I lived in Tallahassee. I was in grad school at Florida State, and I was outside on my front lawn washing my car. And uh, uh, a man came up to me and just started speaking Spanish. I don't speak any Spanish, so I had to carefully explain to him that I didn't know what he was saying to me. I remember at one time I was shopping at a, at a filings basement in Atlanta. It's a, uh, sort of a discount department store. And um, as I was browsing for clothes, a woman asked me if I spoke English. Um, and I, you know, I explained that I did. I mean, you know, I guess sometimes I, I, in, in, I find myself in situations where uh, people do in fact try to kind of fix my, my racial position or my ethnic position, but uh, for the most part, uh, most, most folks, I would say, don't bother to, don't bother to ask. Hmm. That is fascinating. Um, well, if I get one more before we move forward, uh, do you think mm -hmm. if, you, uh, if you wanted to, if you just said, hey, I'm going to say that I'm a white person, do you think you'd be challenged? Do you think anybody would disagree or dispute that claim if you just said, hey, I'm going to classify myself as white, I'm going to put that all the forms? Uh, do you think that would be disputed? Well, 
I mean, you know, I, uh, no, I mean, I don't know, maybe, I don't, I don't know. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a really tough question. No one's ever really asked me that before. I mean, I, I, there are certainly places in which I feel as if, um, you know, there, 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 there are places in which, uh, my, my racial identity becomes sort of salient to my consciousness, but I would say that those places are few and far between. I mean, obviously, the, I would say the, the place in which my racial identity becomes clearest to me, or at least is sort of brought to the forefront of my thinking, is like when I'm at the airport, right? I mean, I have a funny name, and, or at least, uh, you know, I have, a, I have an Islamic-sounding name. Uh, and, you know, I do worry about maybe whether or not I'm going to get an extra pat down or something like that. But that's, uh, that's the only time it really, I would say, occurs to me. Hmm. Okay. And just, I guess, for uh, my curiosity, how, how do you uh, classify, like when you have forms, uh, driver's license, things of that nature, census, how do you classify when they ask for your racial classification? Well, whichever sort of checkbox is closest to multiracial is usually the one I pick. Hmm. Got it. Okay. Uh, this program, context of white supremacy, uh, I have unfortunately concluded uh, we are in a global system of racism, mm-hmm. white supremacy, and I use both of those terms as synonyms. I have the same definition for both terms. That definition is as follows. A global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they <laughs> classify as not white. Uh, do you think okay. such a system exists? Do you think that's an accurate definition? Well, um, I mean, you could certainly make the case that there are globally pervasive structures of racism. Um, and I would, I would agree if that's a fair synonym for what you just said, then I'd be willing to agree with that. Mm, uh, it's not, um, yeah, okay. that's, that's not, um, well, I mean, certainly I will agree. I will agree with the fact that, um, that there are systems of white privilege that exist within a variety of social, political, legal, and cultural institutions and that the, what makes the structure of white privilege a structure of white privilege is the fact that it is precisely whiteness that gets coded as silent and as protected. Um, and I, that's, that's something that I, uh, that I basically take as a background of my intellectual practice. Okay. Um, just for listeners, uh, this is something that I point out on a pretty regular basis. Um, I've been to the White Privilege Conference, uh, I've talked to a lot of the folks who white write and use the uh, language, the rhetoric, if you will, of white privilege. And uh, I don't think that is an accurate uh, synonym. Uh, really, I feel like that is one of the more insidious ways that racism, white supremacy is practiced, uh, where people are not really speaking honestly about what's happening. Uh, that's why I try to be very specific. Uh, when I say racism, racism is white supremacy. Uh, and that means specifically a group of people who say that they are white and they work worldwide to dominate and abuse everyone that they say is not white. And I think that is quite a bit different. I think even when people say that there are structures and or institutions, again, I think that is, I think, deliberate, deceitful rhetoric to draw attention away because I don't think you can have, quote unquote, institutions or structures or customs or statutes without people. People at the end of the day have to make up all of those things. People doing things, not doing things, enforcing things to make what is called white privilege, i.e. racism, white supremacy, to make that work worldwide where non-white people are mistreated and white people get things that are not deserved uh, and or are just in positions of power and control, if that makes sense. Does what I just said, does that make sense? Or do you, am I saying things that are illogical? No, no, I don't, I don't think that you're, that you're saying things that are illogical. And I would certainly agree that institutions and uh, legal structures and the like are constituted by people. But the reason why, at least, uh, I use the vocabulary of institutions is because sort of unless you can sort of detail, right, the, the, a global system like the one you're describing would require a massive degree of coordination. And unless you can prove that 
I, I guess, unless you can prove that there is sort of a, uh, a conscious level of coordination between all people who classify themselves as white, then you have to find the ways in which that coordination happens to manifest outside of, you might say, uh, immediate communication. And so institutions are become, you know, institutions allow sort of the coordination of racist practices to occur even when people aren't, don't recognize themselves as working together. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, before we get to your book, uh, I was very interested. Uh, one of your areas of interest is rhetoric, uh, language, yeah. I take it. Uh, I wanted to get more detail specifically about what exactly you study with regards to rhetoric, what that means for our listeners. Sure. Um, the way that, I mean, I was, uh, I was trained in, let's see, these days in, in most universities, the study of rhetoric is practiced primarily in two places, in English departments and in communication departments. And I was trained as a communication scholar, uh, which means that I've come to study rhetoric through that tradition. The, one of the basic differences, and of course this isn't the only one, but one of the basic differences between rhetoric as it's practiced in English and rhetoric as it's practiced in communication is that communication is always sort of since its origins, you might say, in the early 20th century, communication has been uh, uh, concerned with a tradition of public speech and public address. So uh, rhetoric as it's practiced in communication concerns itself with uh, public documents, public speeches, public events, public texts, as opposed to rhetoric as it's practiced in English, which might work through things like uh, literature or poetry or uh, music or the arts. Um, and, you know, certainly there's a great degree of overlap between those two things, but basically uh, when, when I say that I'm a... I'm a scholar and a student of rhetoric. What, it, what I mean by that is that uh, I'm incredibly interested in the relationship between uh, what we say and the way that uh, the public imagination is animated, the way that uh, public policy is influenced, the way that uh, public opinion is formed. Uh, and generally speaking, it's, it's, I'm teaching a course in rhetorical theory this semester, and it's what I tell students on the first day. I think that the uh, the quickest way to understand what I mean by rhetoric is to say that rhetoric is the study of uh, the, the study of the various ways in which the way we put things matters, right? So uh, I mean, we all know that uh, we right, we try to say. Um, you know, oftentimes, you can try to say the same thing in two different ways. But what rhetoric measures, at least the way I view it, is rhetoric studies the difference between what was said and what might have been said, or the differences that emerge when two things are said, when something is said in two different ways. And so, um, when I when I say that I study rhetoric, I'm very concerned with the manner in which we put things, uh, in addition to the arguments that we happen to assemble in our everyday lives. Fascinating. Uh, what if you've paid attention? What percentage of the students, faculty members, uh, in the department or fields of study with regards to rhetoric? What percentage of the folks in that area are white? Are black? White. Oh, are white. Um, well, uh, I mean, it, I've I've been in different places, and I've been to. Uh, the uh, you know the National Communication Association conference. Um, you know I've been to smaller conferences that study sport and the like, uh, and so you know whatever answer I give you is fundamentally anecdotal. Right. But um, you know and, you know I've, for example I I worked for a little, for some time at uh, Georgia State University where uh, my you know the classes in which I taught um, and the colleagues, and if, even if you include the, the colleagues, I mean, I don't, I don't know the official numbers on Georgia State, but it wouldn't surprise me if Georgia State was less than 50%, if not smaller than that, um, white. I mean, basically my classes were about, uh, uh, roughly speaking, half black and half white. That was at Georgia State. Uh, when I taught at Villanova, I had just, I mean, I, I could count the number of black students I had there in three years on one hand. Um, and then uh, here at uh, USF, you get sort of a traditionally diverse range of students and colleagues, um, you know, uh, that sort of fall along uh, patterns that are similar to state census numbers. Hmm. Huh. Okay. Would, would I be incorrect in thinking that uh, when you talked earlier about 
the ways in which uh, what you call the system of white privilege, what I say is the system of white supremacy, uh, the mm-hmm. ways in which that system is coordinated, uh, you'd have to find uh, different means of how that's done. Would I be incorrect in thinking that rhetoric and the way that we talk about racism is one of the ways that that system is coordinated? Oh, yeah. No, there's, there's, there's no question about that. I mean, rhetoric is a, one way to think of it is as a mode of communication. I mean, if, I mean, so, you know, at least the way I, the way, the way I see it, right? Racism uh, is something that marries uh, linguistic practices to, let's say, non-linguistic practices, right? So there are, you know, there, there are actions which we can regard as violent, right, uh, or abusive, um, and then there is the language that makes those violences and abuses possible. Um, and, you know, so just to say that rhetoric is certainly part of a, a, the system or a structure of racism is, I think, exactly the point. And, and, you know, there's an entire... There's a, there's a broad range of scholarship on this that actually precedes communication studies. It precedes uh, the study of rhetoric. And in, in the 1970s, 1980s, there was an entire movement called uh, CLS, Critical Legal Scholarship. And essentially the function of this was to expose the ways in which language was racist. Uh, language was embedded in legal documents that helped to uh, sort of permit or authorize a variety of racist practices. So, I mean, you know, the idea that there's a relationship between language and racism is, I might say, as old as racism itself. Hmm. Great point. Great point. Uh, could, is it, do you have, like, just off the top of your head, uh, a book or several uh, that you could recommend hmm. if folks want to further explore that topic, the relationship between racism, language, rhetoric? Oh, wow. Uh, that really puts me on the spot. Um, Boy, uh, you know, there, there's a, um, there's a, uh, in, in communication studies, there's a, there's a book that was, I think, originally published in 1990, and then it's been through a couple of editions. Um, Omi and Winant uh, have a book called Racial Formation in the United States. Um, and uh, I've got it here on the bookshelf. I can find it somewhere. But um, that's, a, that's sort of the go-to text uh, in communication studies for describing uh, the relationship between uh, language and race, and you know, and there's a, you know, there's really an, 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 an when I say an entire tradition, I mean I'm I'm just a, a small part of that tradition, and um, you know, you, you just thumb through the academic journals in communication studies, or thumb through the, uh, you know, uh, 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 one example here is um, the University Press of Mississippi. The University Press of, Press of Mississippi published my book, but they deal sort of exclusively in uh, issues related to um, black history and, um, and, black, and the black arts. And, uh, you know, you can pick up any of their books and you'll, get, you'll find somewhere in there uh, a, a kind of discussion of the relationship between language and race. Outstanding. I will check on that once the program concludes. Racism and language. You talk about that all the time. Uh, all right. Uh, let's go ahead. We'll move, get to your book specifically, uh, Kurt Flood and the media where rhetoric and language is going to pop up again uh, in the way that he talks about his case and is trying to articulate his argument and the counter arguments. That's kind of a big part of, of what you talk about in your book, unless I misread. Um, you start off talking about a lot of the, I'll call them uh, kind of gripes, uh, rants that's, that's been thrown around a lot the last two weeks against current uh, current black athletes. Got to make sure I put that in current black athletes and saying that right. they are not uh, sticking up for the black race. They are not articulating uh, problems that black people are facing because of racism. They're selfish. Uh, they're just focused on getting as much money as they can. They have no knowledge of all of the struggles uh, that different black people like Kurt Flood uh, Tommy Smith, Juan Carlos, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Jim Brown, da 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 da, long list. Mm-hmm. Jackie Robinson. That all these people right. sacrificed for them to make all this money. They don't know. They don't care. Uh, militantly ignorant. Uh, <laughs> phrase from Dr. Right. Uh, Harry Edwards, who's also been a guest on the program. Uh, and you uh-huh. offer, I think, some interesting critiques of that, which I thought were were fascinating. I want to read a little bit of your book and then kind of go from there. This is uh, very early on, page six in the book. You're talking about. Uh, Spike Lee filmmaker. Uh, You write, perhaps the most impassioned 
uh, admonition to appear in the last few years come from, comes from filmmaker Spike Lee, who in 2005 wrote the introduction to a reprint of Jackie Robinson's 1964 integrationist treatise, uh, treatise, Baseball Has Done It, capturing the spirit of its theme and deriving a lesson from its purported failure Lee traces over the familiar golden lineage of black athletes from whom the current stars ought to take their cue. Today's African-American athletes owe everything to Jackie Robinson and to others like him, such as Jesse Owens, such as Joe Lewis, such as Kurt Flood, who sacrificed his career, sacrificed his life in challenging the reserve clause in baseball. If it weren't for people like Kurt Flood and Jackie and Jesse and Joe, the athletes of today wouldn't be making the kind of money they're making. Unfortunately, the only thing that matters to today's players is getting paid. They're not educated about the past, so their level of consciousness is not high. They know nothing of the many African-American athletes who put their careers on the line to fight for future generations. Men like John Carlos, Tommy Smith, Muhammad Ali, Jackie, Jim Brown, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bill Russell. We can't forget these people. Can't forget their stories. They are great American stories. Those who watched professional basketball in the early 1990s may detect an uneasy irony in Spike's commentary. His alter ego, Mars Blackman, appeared in a popular series of Nike commercials with Michael Jordan selling sneakers. Mars obviously got paid. Uh, I'll stop there. Uh, I would also add anyone who watches Knicks basketball, Spike Lee is pretty much cemented uh, in the front row of Knicks basketball games. So folks might even point that out as a mild contradiction as well. I'm sure those seats are not free and he's been there for many, many, many years. A uh, long time patron, even on road games, he will pop up pretty frequently at Knicks contests. Uh, can you kind of articulate some of the problems that you see with this constant critique of Exclusively, it seems to me, black athletes for not having this knowledge and not yeah. doing more to speak out against racism and other social ills. Yeah, um, that's actually the sort of the um, I would I would argue the main thrust of the book, and uh, at least it's my claim. And the story of Kurt Flood is itself interesting in its own right. And I don't want to sort of uh, you know I want to dismiss the insights that come from the story of, of from Kurt Flood's own story. Uh, but what I argue the was the contemporary significance of the Kurt Flood story is, is sort of this point. Um, the the biggest problem I have, and you know, certainly Spike Lee had his say, and you heard that business about great American stories, um, and you know, him sort of wagging his finger at the likes of uh, you know current ad, like you know Michael Jordan or whoever guys who just want to get paid. Uh, there's there's Spike Lee, and then there's also there were a, a couple of books written written recently in, in 2007 and 2008 by uh, Bill Roden and Sean Powell, respectively. And uh, these are books uh, that basically make the argument that, you know, uh, that the class of current athletes, current black athletes, has essentially ignored the entire rich history of these of activist predecessors. And they, they, they very, these books very much shame the current generation of athletes. And the, the problem, I think, that, or at least the kind of irony that I, that I want to point out here is that if you, if you sort of look at the way in which the, that generation of athletes is uh, celebrated, right? if, you, if you look specifically to Jackie Robinson, I spent a lot of time talking about Jackie Robinson in the book, but if you look at Jackie Robinson uh, and if you look at, um, uh, in particular, Kurt Flood, um, right, the, the whole reason to, to celebrate them is that they sort of fought their way to be treated um, equal by whites within high-priced economic institutions. In other words, they got paid, right? And so it, what it is, it's sort of a, it's a, it's a way of blaming contemporary athletes for having fulfilled the promise of progress as it was defined by the generation who was fighting it, right? And so there's sort of a, a kind of an irony, or at some point in the book, I think I, I call it a psychosis, that um, is uh, embedded in some forms of black liberalism today, right? I mean, forms of black liberalism, which essentially are carrying the torch for integration, are in many ways ignoring and delegitimizing uh, what at the same time kind of could have been understood as a fight for social justice. So uh, I, I spend a chapter discussing Harry Edwards, not uh, current Harry Edwards. I, uh, I would love to talk to Harry Edwards at some point if I get a chance, but 
um, you know, the, the, the way that Harry Edwards spoke, the rhetoric of Harry Edwards in 1968 and 1969. I mean, he was a, you know, he imagined himself as a revolutionary. He hung, you know, he, he hung out in the Bay Area where the Panthers were hanging out. Uh, and, you know, he wore, a, you know, he wore the dark sunglasses, he wore the beret, and he made arguments explicitly in the name of blackness. It wasn't a question of, you know, can we, can we share this space together? Can we all get along? It was, you know, sort of a Malcolm X inflected way of speaking. Um, and that story then, that sort of more radical story becomes much harder to tell uh, according to the triumph of black liberalism. But it's, it's exactly liberals who are calling out the current gen of generation of athletes for engaging or for having sort of availed themselves of progress as liberalism had defined it. Uh, and that's the, I think, the contemporary significance of the Kurt Flood story. I mean, Kurt Flood fits into that because the, the reason why we're supposed to celebrate Kurt Flood is that he helped everybody get paid, right? I mean, he paved the way, as the story goes, for what's now known as free agency in professional sports. Uh, and it is free agency in professional sports that takes the blame, essentially, for making contemporary athletes so well paid. Uh, and so, right, with, you know, the, the irony with Kurt Flood is, I mean, you want to both celebrate him as a hero, and then at the same time, uh, you know, sort of take your shots or shame contemporary black athletes for, in fact, having made themselves rich. Hmm. Huh. When when you say uh, black uh, black liberalism, uh, what do you mean specifically? Well, uh, I'm talking about in, in the categories. I use I borrow my categories. I don't I don't try to sort of reinvent or rewrite an entire history of uh, black liberalism whole cloth. Um, I borrow my terms from the late uh, and great uh, Manning Marable. Uh, Maribel uh, wrote, uh, he, boy, he's, he's probably written 40 books, uh, and uh, his uh, poor guy, poor Manning Maribel, he passed away three days before his, uh, his magnum opus, his book on Malcolm X was released, that was about two years ago. Um, and uh, anyway, I, I draw my categories from Maribel, and Maribel argues that there are three traditions, three basic traditions uh, uh, po uh, within uh, black political culture in the 20th century. And those three traditions are uh, 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 black, uh, I'm sorry, black nationalism, um, integrationism, which he also calls inclusionism, uh, and transformationism. Uh, and so black nationalism is defined uh, according to the idea that political progress or political efforts should be sort of aimed at um, building um, uh, black institutions and all black uh, social and political structures, uh, such as, you know, black banks and, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, sort of having uh, black civic institutions and things like that. Um, and then inclusionism is, uh, is sort of basically the logic through which uh, integrationism, uh, you know, kind of uh, propelled itself throughout the 1950s and 1960s uh, with respect to, you know, integrating lunch counters, integrating bus systems, integrating schools and the like. Um, and then transformationism, Marable, Mar Mar he always sort of holds out this possibility for transformationism, but argues that um, it, it never really come to pass. And I think one of the examples that Marable uses, <coughs> pardon me, of transformationism is the shifting thoughts of both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King just prior to their death. So Malcolm X had sort of repudiated or at least uh, began, begun to sort of rethink a divinely inspired uh, universal condemnation of white folks, and Martin Luther King has had sort of started to turn left on issues related to uh, the Vietnam War uh, and on issues related to uh, poverty in the U.S. And sort of Marable sort of sees transformationism as the best hope, uh, but also one that has rarely found its way into the political mainstream. Um, and so when I say black liberalism, I'm talking about that integrationist tradition and the way that uh, the way we talk about race and, uh, and, and systems of race uh, right now is always through a logic of integrationism. And I think the primary example of this is through the way we talk about diversity. Our institutions must be made, must, must be made diverse. Right, which means that we need a face of this color and a face of that color and a face of this other color, and now we will have a diverse institution, which doesn't necessarily speak to what the institution does, doesn't necessarily change the practices of the institution, but it includes a lot of different kinds of faces. Right? Uh, and so when I speak of black liberalism, I'm talking about a, uh, a certain kind of political language that rests on 
um, uh, ideas of diversity, of tolerance, and of inclusion. Hmm. Okay. Um, I would point out, going back to rhetoric, the rhetoric of how we talk about racism, and in my view, how the language and the way that we talk about racism, uh, for the most part, has been fashioned uh, by racists, uh, at minimum has been fashioned by white people. Uh, I think when, and that's why I don't use the term integration, I don't use the term liberal either, um, those terms, just what they describe, if what I say when I talk about racism, white supremacy is a global system of people who are dedicated, global system of people who classify themselves as white, who are dedicated to abusing, dominating everyone in the known universe whom they say is not white, that you cannot solve that problem by quote unquote integrating, uh, by hanging out, being around other white people, that does not solve the problem. Integration does not solve racism. And I think that would be, it would be proven to be obvious uh, by the fact that racism is still a problem, even though most people would say that we have quote unquote integration. Uh, if they mean white people, non-white people hanging out together, going to school together, maybe even getting married, whatever they talk about when they say integration, it seems that we have that uh, to a large degree, but racism is still a big problem. Uh, I would even say one of the folks that you quote in your book, who's been a guest on our program, uh, Dr. John Hoberman, University of Texas, Austin, his book, Darwin's Athletes. I think he makes a great point in that book, how the integration of sports, whatever folks mean when they say integration, if you just mean including a sizable number of black athletes uh, in professional sports, that is OK with racism, white supremacy. Uh, you had quite a few white people who scoffed some more than other, others uh, with the inclusion of black athletes. But by and large, that's no big deal. And that, again, is obvious. It is self-evident. You have lots and lots of black athletes who make a lot of money, lots of commercials. Some of them are even the stars uh, on their respective teams. Some of them are even the stars of their respective leagues. But racism still seems to be a gigantic problem, uh, I would say, for them, the league in general, for black people on the whole. Um, that I would say, even just going to John, uh, Darwin's athletes, John Hoberman, you reference it in the book as his point. Does it make yeah. sense you do reference him in your book? Yeah, and and uh, and actually, I want to sort of, if I can, uh, complicate that story just just a little bit because I think that one of the ways, and again, in, you know, I, I deal with with talk, and I think that one of the ways that um, that as you put it, right, I mean, you know, if, you, if you've got, you know, every every NFL team, its best player is uh, is a black player, yet racism persists, right? Every, um, you know, every, uh, uh, I don't know, basketball team, right? The NBA is dominated by black athletes. Um, uh, the, and I think one of the things that Hoverman's book does a really good job of explaining is the relationship between uh, the way racism works in relation to uh, uh, sort of different different values and attributes associated with mind and body, right? And so, uh, you know, when you think about, right, the NFL has, has the, the struggle of racism for the National Football League, I mean, it has a, a number of things to deal with, but and maybe this can ultimately get us to Richard Sherman, but one of the things that, uh, that the NFL has had to deal with is the dearth of black coaches and black quarterbacks. And so, right, racism manifests as, at least the, right, racist talk manifests as a, sort of in the, in the different ways in which we describe mental tasks and bodily tasks, right? So, it, you know, racism persists despite the fact that, you know, the best player on your local NFL team might be a black player, but that's because it, is, it becomes culturally and socially permissible for black folks to be good at using their bodies, right? When it comes to using one's mind, right, that still uh, is, is sort of a preserved space uh, for, for white folks. Uh, and this is one of the things that Richard Sherman, I think, really sort of uh, upsets and complicates as, we, as, as the, the world, it seems, uh, starts to discuss it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, wow, I'm, I'm stuck with the <laughs> Sherman or do I want to move forward? I guess uh, there there were a few other points from your book that I wanted to to touch on. But since you sure. brought it up with uh, with Richard Sherman, uh, I think that incident, it reminded me 
of several points in your book where you're talking about Kurt Flood, where okay. even though he, he makes this uh, comment about being a well-paid slave, uh, that he tries to make it, this is not so much a race thing, even though I am a black person and it's almost impossible in a system of racism for it to not be a race thing. This essentially mm-hmm. is just about, hey, I'm a baseball player and I want to have the same rights as anyone else right. to seek gainful employment, to get the best salary that I can get, to play where I want. Mm-hmm. That is not essentially a race thing. That's something that we all as baseball players should be in on, white, black, all of us, you know, we should have the same uh, argument or have the same stake in this, not necessarily it being a quote unquote black thing. With right. Richard Sherman, his rant, so they call it, after the game mm-hmm. was not about him being a black thing. If anything, he was uh, focusing his frustrations at another black player. So it really had nothing to do with race, ostensibly. It's just a football player who's mouthing off after a game, which happens pretty regularly uh, from what I've seen, not just in football with athletics, where uh, they are jumping up and down and talking about how great they are, doing their uh, really mm-hmm. even outside of athletics, just an American thing. I'm a rugged individual. Meritocracy. Right. I can do it. I can go out. I did it. I did something great. I want to talk about it. Uh, and and I'm self-promoting. There's a camera here. I can talk and talk about myself, get endorsements. We're about to go to the Super Bowl. I think they're even selling uh, T-shirts here in Seattle with uh, uh-huh. don't open your mouth about me or whatever, taking a paraphrase from the quote that he said. They have it on T-shirts and making all kinds of money. I mean, that's the American way, right? On. Self-entrepreneurship, go out and promote yourself. It immediately mm-hmm. becomes a black thing. Uh, and not just a uh-huh. black thing, it becomes a racist thing uh, where that gets pulled into it immediately. Uh, and I, I mean, it seemed to me, it seemed like I just as I was reading your book, like I am seeing some parallels between what happened with Richard Sherman and Curtis Flood. Uh, does that does that make sense? Do you see any other parallels? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, one of the as I, as I said, the, the easiest definition of rhetoric for me is it's the study of the various ways in which how we put things matter. Uh, and um, the what, what that what the, the sort of corollary to that or what comes along with that. Uh, is the idea that talk circulates, right? talk moves. Uh, it doesn't just sort of stay in one place, it gets pushed along. Um, and uh, what that means is that when we, when we talk, uh, and it really doesn't matter what we're talking about, but in particular, in this case, when we're talking about race or trying to not talk about race, uh, we have to sort of attend to where our, uh, to where our talk will circulate. And so one of the things that, in, in, you know, Kurt Flood, he, you know, he, he was very astute, right? Kurt, Kurt Flood was a super bright guy, uh, and you only have to pick his book. The book is called, his book, or, or originally written in 1970, is called The Way It Is, and it is just a terrific treatise, a, a sort of a uh, kind of a period piece uh, that explains or that illustrates what life was like for a baseball player uh, in the 1960s. Um, and, you know, Kurt Flood was a super bright guy, and he knew that in order to win, right, and not just, not just in order to make a splash but, or, or, you know, just stir things up or, or whatever else, but in order to actually win his case and be granted free agency, he needed to do two things at once and that these two things cut against each other and that he needed to figure out how to manage that problem. The first thing he needed to do was forge a coalition with white ballplayers, right? Uh, in, back in 1969, he met with the players' representatives. They, they weren't quite a union yet, but they had formed a players' association, and each team had appointed one player as its representative, and each of these players was white. And so when Kurt Flood spoke to the player representatives back in, in Puerto Rico in 1969, uh, he knew that he needed to say things that would reassure them and would uh, help forge a coalition with them because they were the org- organization that held uh, the most immediate institutional power and influence that could help his case. But the other thing that he, that he knew was that black audiences, particularly radical black audiences, would totally be on his side. And so he, he had to find ways to speak to them. And so this idea of being a well-played slave was an elastic term. It was an elastic term because on the one hand, it connected with the experiences of white players who also could not negotiate, could not be free agents, had to accept whatever the owners told them, and may have lived lives that felt to them like slavery. It, 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 could, it could connect with them, but it could also connect right, with a 
burgeoning, right, with a growing body of uh, radical black discourse, right, that understood the uh, the overall relationship between white society and 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 blackness as being one of a relationship between a master and a slave, or at least between a dominant and uh, and, a, and an inferior, right, or a superior and an inferior, and so. What the, this idea of the well-paid slave, right? It, it was a way of trying to sort of have things both ways, secure both of those audiences uh, simultaneously to get his to get his his way of viewing the world to circulate in both audiences. Now, I think what happened in the case of Richard Sherman, I could see sort of the parallel. I think that you're drawing. What happened in the case of Richard Sherman was you're right. I mean, there's Richard Sherman sort of punking a uh, you know what he what he regarded as uh, an inferior player, right? A player that he was basically locking down and beating the entire game, uh, and he uh, you know has a high opinion of himself for very good reason. I mean, he's probably the best defensive back in the NFL, um, but uh, and you know and then he sort of appears right on television, and there's you know uh, Aaron Andrews with you know the, the microphone looking all startled. And uh, he, right, when, when he spoke, this discourse is going to circulate, right? It's going to circulate in a variety of places. It's going to circulate um, in sort of spaces that are marked by black discourse in which this is, you know, hardly startling. It's going to circulate in places that, you know, like uh, among white folks on Facebook who, you know, just want to, who, who are sort of annoyed and offended by the whole thing or see, you know, I don't know, shades of Stokely Carmichael in this, in this type of speech. And so... The point here is that I think if we want to draw a parallel, the parallel is in having a kind of attunement or a sensitivity to the, the idea that when we talk, our talk will circulate, and it's going to circulate in different areas, and it's going to mean things to different audiences. That is fascinating, just that the, the metaphor that you just mentioned, that, that somehow for some white people, hearing Richard Sherman bash another black guy. Again, this was not uh, Mr. Crabtree, the 49ers wide receiver. This is a black guy uh, that he's talking about being mediocre and you're, you're no good and all that. Uh, that for some white people hearing that would make them think of Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture uh, and black power from the 1960s. That is incredible. Uh, but for me, that goes back to what I said earlier about and even the sound clip that we started with from Dr. Curry talking about this is racist logic. This is the way that white thought is coordinated. Uh, and I would even point out the response. I was in Seattle, but I wasn't watching the game because we had a program at the time mm -hmm. that this game was being played. I almost wish that we had not been on the air so I could have seen all this play out live time. But when the game ended or when our program ended, the game ended, I went, I looked online. Within about two hours, there were images popping up on Twitter, Facebook, other social media outlets where they had photoshopped Richard Sherman's face with the face of the monster from Predator. I don't know if you're familiar with mm. those. Okay. Uh, yeah. They had photoshopped it because he has like the kind of dreadlock kind of thing going on or whatever. Uh, and that was one. Uh, and then they had another one where they took the scene from the Aliens franchise movies where it was mm. the alien next to the white woman, Sigourney Weaver. Uh, where she's in tears, terrified, and the alien is drooling and all that. And they uh, photoshopped it and put some cute uh, caption on it. About, oh, look at Richard Sherman uh, with Aaron Andrews. And these photos, and I mean, this happened within moments of the game ending. These photos yeah. were retweeted and reshared thousands of times. And these didn't come from uh, John Madden, John Gruden, some, you know, famous sports personality. These were just, you know, regular folks sitting around on their computer after the game. And the racist thought where black people are not seen, as you talked about, that black black people are not seen as human beings. They are seen regarded as beasts, animals. Uh, really, both of these creatures in these films are ultimately killed. Something mm -hmm. that should be violently dealt with. Uh, and just hearing that, the language of thug and everything else, nigger, all of the other vile things that were said, it made me even flash back in the book where you were talking about great passage, I thought, when we go to say, hey, we're tired of Richard Sherman. We don't want to hear you talking loud and screaming because even some black people were critical. It wasn't just white people. I want to make sure I get that out, too. It wasn't just uh, white people who were critical. I heard quite a few black people as well who spoke out and said, this is a disgrace. This is embarrassing. Have some class uh, and even kind of in the same vein. We're tired of this. We don't want to hear any more of these young, overpaid, spoiled black athletes yelling about how cool they are 
and saying nothing about racism and serious problems that black people are facing. And they will hold up, in contrast, Muhammad Ali, Bill Russell, so on and so forth. It made me, this, this passage right here, if you'll allow, read a little bit from your book. Uh, you write, mm-hmm. this is on page one, 172. Uh, you write, uh, the gaps in player memories, it would seem, are not limited to flood. As Chas reiterated in 1997, professional athletes, for the most part, live in their time. They generally don't care what happened before them and, worse, they often don't know. Sadly, many baseball players wouldn't even be able to identify Flood, wouldn't even know he was the forerunner of Andy Messersmith, another name they wouldn't recognize for the impact he had on their lives. Chaz's reprimand of current players' failure to remember or acknowledge their forerunners evokes Harry Edwards' accusation of militant ignorance and Spike Lee's admonition, admonishing tone regarding the disappearance of the activist athlete from the contemporary sports scene. However, according to Chas and others, the militant ignorance practiced by contemporary players has little to do with race, social justice, or political significance, but instead revolves around the failure to appreciate what has made massive athlete wealth possible. In its elegy, the Houston Chronicle contrasted Flood with a dubious list of the craven and selfish who probably did not know that he had lived, let alone died. In quotes, all of the millionaires Kirk Flood helped make when Flood succumbed to cancer last January, not a single contemporary player attended his funeral. Not Shaquille O'Neal, he of the $110 million dollars a free agent contract with the Los Angeles Lakers, not Chad Brown of the $24 million free agent contract with the Seattle Seahawks, not Albert Bell of the more than $50 million free agent contract with the Chicago White Sox, not anyone. Sadly, Flood experienced in death the kind of neglect and solitude he once knew in life. And little seems to have changed by the summer of 2009, as Burwell put it the day after the St. Louis All-Star game, mentions Flood's name around all-star clubhouses and the reactions are mixed with touches of vague recognition. Neglect and solitude says just about everyone provided that the targets of disdain are overpaid professional athletes. I would insert overpaid black athletes. Uh, Mm -hmm. In recent essay, in a recent essay on the rehabilitated reputation enjoyed by former Boston Celtic basketball star, Bill Russell, Murray Nelson argues that the shift in the Russell narrative is motivated less by racial atonement or reevaluation than by a desire to discipline contemporary black athletic style. Russell at one time was detested by a media establishment that coded his surliness as black anger, a lens that resulted in racially tinctured characterizations of his athletic ability. Since then, Russell has come to be regarded as one of the National Basketball Association's ideal ambassadors. Writes Nelson, a man so reviled in youth has become in his senior years a spokesperson for comportment in a sporting milieu perceived by many to be overrun overrun with antisocial misfits and hedonists motivated solely by self-promotion. I will stop right there because I think that is just it's a beautiful uh, contrast with Richard Sherman, because I feel like he would be someone they would point to be like, we don't need any more of you, Richard Sherman's. Why can't you behave like Bill Russell? He won all those championships and he never was jumping up and down in the camera and saying all this as though there was widespread love for Bill Russell in his 60s. Could I get your response on that? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, that's uh, that's certainly true. I mean, but here's the thing. Right. I mean, I think that you're right. Right, that you know, obviously the 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 the, the doctored photographic images, right, with the alien or the predator or whatever else. I mean, these things are. Um, it's 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 almost like, um, uh, you know, when when they don't happen, that's when you're surprised, right? Um, and I guess, and you you could be right, right? The, in let's say I don't know, ten years from now, or maybe even I don't know, next week, right, the day after the Super Bowl, I don't know, right? Maybe Richard Sherman. Uh, get, begins to occupy a kind of ambassador role for the NFL in the same way that 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 Bill Russell now now enjoys for the NBA. But uh, you know the fact that 
something like that can occur so quickly, I think speaks to me to uh, what I would regard as kind of the real news regarding Richard Sherman. I mean, the fact that there were people who said racist things about Richard Sherman, frankly, you know, and it, this obviously is no kind commentary about the world, but it's, it's hardly a surprise. What's, I think, interesting is the way in which the mainstream sports media goes into overdrive to kind of compensate, right? And so... Um, if you were to, you know, the day, I mean, certainly, right, I mean, check, check, a, check a Facebook page or check someone's, you know, Twitter feed or whatever else, you're going to find some racist crap. But if you, right, if, if, you, if you check out the mainstream sports media, you know, uh, Richard Sherman writes a column for MMQB on, on sportsillustrated.com. Uh, there were, there was an article, there were articles on ESPN. There were articles in opinion columns in local online news sources there were blog posts, etc. each of them defending Richard Sherman. And in many ways, the kind of overwhelming response, mainstream media response to Richard Sherman was, you know, was, was sort of in defense, or if not in defense, in apology, right? Uh, and so, you know, there were, and you heard a variety of different arguments made. And the reason why I call that the real news about Richard Sherman is because it seems to me that, you know, and, and this, is, this is an idea that I'm, it's sort of in the middle of formulating, and I'm not, I'm not even sure I have my mind fully wrapped around it yet, but uh, we live in an era in which racism is, race itself is a social construction, right? I mean, the world seems to agree that race is a social construction. Uh, and we live in a world in which, um, uh, we live in a world in which race then is very difficult to find, which also makes racism very difficult to find, which means that it is events like these which then provide us with the language of anti-racism. And so Richard Sherman, for me, is sort of a case study in how the, in, 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 in laying out what the arguments, the anti-racist, the available anti-racist arguments are. So, you know, I mean, there was, there was a wide variety of responses. For example, some folks pointed out that, you know, it seems awfully hypocritical to call Richard Sherman a thug and then watch the NFL, which is, you know, the most violent, one of the most violent sports outside of maybe motor sports that you can watch, right? Uh, you know, also people pointed out that, uh, you know, that thug is a code word, right? And everybody seemed to know that code is a, uh, uh, that thug is a code word, right, for old racist, uh, racist epithets. Uh, there were, uh, you know, a number of folks, uh, particularly uh, in, 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 there was a great Deadspin article uh, where uh, the, the writer of the Deadspin article pointed out that Richard Sherman has a Stanford education, right? He's got an MA from Stanford. He had a, you know, a 3.29 GPA. He's a bright guy. And, you know, he's, this is a smart person who, uh, you know, was, he just had a, 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 a microphone in his face at the end of a game. There were, some folks, there were some folks who said, ah, no, no, this is a big trick, right? What Richard Sherman did was engage in this startling speech so that uh, he would become uh, he would become more well known, and then we would all buy his jersey, and we would pay more attention to him, and everything else. And there were business right. Bloomberg dot com had an article that pointed out the instant, I mean, the overnight marketing advantages for Richard Sherman for having given the speech that he gave at the end of the game. And so, right, there's a variety of defenses and apologia for Richard Sherman that, to me, are far more interesting than the racist crap that gets fired at. And don't get me wrong, right? The racist crap needs to be called racist crap, but the way in which there was sort of this, this mobilization of the uh, mainstream, mainstream anti-racist forces, that became kind of the fascinating response for me. Hmm. That is interesting. Um, I would point out, I guess, number one, since we have pointed out the significance of language, particularly, particularly when talking about racism, uh, I wouldn't reference it and i would encourage listeners not to think of it as quote unquote racist crap uh because i think just the term crap it minimizes uh if we're saying this is a global system uh, and this sort of thing happens all the time not just in athletics but i'm saying all areas of people activity really i'm saying this is the central force Politically driving the planet, the system of racism, white supremacy, the dominant organizing force with regards to what is motivating people to make sure things are happening, not happening all over the world is racism, white supremacy. So I would uh, encourage people not to use language that minimizes or makes it seem as though this is ignorant 
or trifling uh, or in any way something that is just minutia on the side. I would say this is, as Dr. Tommy Curry said at the very beginning, this is the sort of thing that leads to Trayvon Martin. This is the sort of thing that leads to Miriam Carey, Renisha McBride, this sort of thing right here, which happens all day long. That would be one. Um, just with regards to the marshalling, I think that is pretty common. And, and even I'm not sure I would have to look to see if that's true, because I feel like I've seen a lot of commentary. I'm in Seattle, right? Uh, I've mm -hmm. seen a lot of commentary that was this was not a good thing, even if they even if they came out and said, hey, the racist stuff online and call it a nigger. That wasn't cool. But at the end of the day, what he did was totally classless and run, run, run. Even there were people, uh, Seattle fans who were calling uh, mm -hmm. local talk radio the day after on Monday. Uh, and saying, you know, I love the Seahawks and it's great, but that was just totally tacky and classless. And I can't believe he did that. And ran, ran, ran. And this guy made the game saving uh, play to make sure that they won. And that was happening here. So I'm not sure that there has been a huge force to go out and say this. In fact, I would say that is expected. I think any time in the system of racism, white supremacy, particularly now with what you talk about in the article, it's supposed to be colorblind. We don't see race. We've moved past all that. We have a black president, so we're not supposed to be doing all this stuff anymore. This is not uh, back in Jackie Robinson's era where you go to the game and you get to yell nigger at him all game long. Even the opposing players are yelling nigger and spear chucking all this stuff at him all game long. This isn't supposed to happen. So there is supposed to be a significant amount of condemnation. But I'm not sure that it was an overwhelming force of, hey, uh, this is not cool. You can't go out. We've got to defend Richard Sherman. This is a good guy. I feel like I've seen Tom Brady. I feel like. In fact, I feel like it's been a lot of we're going to root for Peyton Manning. We don't want this guy to win. We don't want Seattle to win. This is the villain. Now we've got the Super Bowl exactly the way we want it. We've got the revered white quarterback, Peyton Manning, against this villainous, beast, classless, overpaid, tacky Richard Sherman, who we definitely don't want to win and get a Super Bowl. It's, I mean, it's, it seems tailor-made for the Super Bowl, not only just to get a lot of viewers, sell merchandise and all of that, but it hits a lot of the same racist angst that happens a lot in sports, where it's, it becomes racial, to borrow Dr. John Hoberman's third, it becomes racial theater, uh, going all the way back to uh, mm -hmm. Jack Johnson, Muhammad Ali, many times over and over again, where it ends up somehow being a black against a white thing. I think you end up with that same kind of archetype, Peyton Manning, and they're on the yeah. opposite sides of the ball. I think it plays exactly into that. I guess the issue I have, though, is that in order to arrive at that narrative, you have to admit that he's a genius, right? I mean, and this is the point about, and this is the reason why I think articles from, uh, if you look at the discourse that circulated, particularly in, like, Wall Street news, right, like Bloomberg.com, Forbes.com, et cetera, right? I mean, uh, all of the sort of the, the financial papers, Right, the financial papers reported with, with sort of with sort of like a glee with glee and a wink, right? That this was a brilliant maneuver, right? Which means that you have to sort of find a way to come to terms with the fact that on the one hand, right, you right, if 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 it on the one hand is sort of an overwhelmingly racist response, then what then accounts for, right, the instant overnight marketing advantage and popularity that is derived? Now, this notion of of racial theater, I think is an important one, right? And that's the reason why I find at least the more interesting dimension of the Richard Sherman story, the sort of anti-racist counter-argument, or at least a, a sort of a counter-argument that calls itself anti-racist, than, you know, than, you know, to sort of attend to the, attend to the racist memes or the, the racist tweets. Right? I mean, and like I said, I, you know, and I, and, I, and I certainly don't intend to minimize uh, racist memes and racist tweets that, 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 that you see on the internet, um, but you know when it comes to the way in which the sports media complex communicates with its audiences. I mean, I don't know how many people watch ESPN every day, but you know when it comes to uh, people who think of themselves as well-meaning, right, and trying to construct for themselves an anti-racist argument, right, we have to learn how to become anti-racist just as easily, or just as much as you know anyone ever learns to become racist. And uh, the idea, at least in my mind, is that, you know, those scripts are, are, are sort of uttered and reiterated on mainstream sports outlets on a daily basis. And that, to me, was the fascinating kind of phenomenon that immediately followed the Richard Sherman incident. I mean, racist tweets, racist Facebook, the next day, right, columns on ESPN, Stephen A. Smith, the defense from Stephen A. Smith, 
you know, on first take, uh, you know, a sports center anchor talking about his Stanford degree, right? Uh, that to me is, is, uh, is, you know, it's, it's, it, it speaks to sort of the nuts and bolts about how everyday people who don't immerse themselves in the scholarship of race learn what anti-racism is. Mm. Context of white supremacy, uh, our guest, University of South Florida professor, Dr. Abraham Khan. Uh, if you have questions, uh, the number to dial 760-569-7676, and the code is 564-943-POUND. Press star six if you have questions. Uh, racism is big business. Uh, I think I think white people mm-hmm. overstand this. Racism is big business. Uh, even the last fight with Floyd Mayweather, white people understand you can make a lot of money with that. What Dr. Hoberman calls racial theater. Um, did I also wanted to make sure I did not misunderstand? I thought this was a really another really important point. I, I think both equally. Uh, number one, the point that I think we talked about already in terms of this rush to criticize these black athletes and how easy it is to hop on them because they don't talk about racism and what have you. Uh, And it it leads right into this, uh, how easy that is and how even contradictory it can be for some of these folks to to make this sort of comment that they should be more like Bill Russell or whomever you want to call out from that era. Mm -hmm. Jackie Robinson, I think, ends up being one of the tops on that list. I think that's a point, unless I misread, you're saying that people like Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, maybe even Richard Sherman, that they do have a lot more in common with Jackie Robinson that we might think because Jackie Robinson was about, I'm just a human being. It's not about me being a black person. It's just about me being an athlete, a human being. I have the skill to do this. I should be allowed to do this, to go out, achieve the best that I can according to the talents that I have. And that's exactly what we've seen from Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, all of these people, Shaquille O'Neal, the people that I just read who get criticized for not saying, hey, I'm a black person. I have black issues. We should focus on those. Did I misread that? No, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, basically the, the kind of the broad outline of my argument is that it is, in fact, the case that Jackie Robinson and Kurt Flood made Michael Jordan possible, right? But... I mean, there's a, there's a point, and I don't know if, if, if at some point um, you sort of, uh, uh, if, if, if this stood out to you uh, in, the, in the parts of the book that, that I shared with you, but um, there's, there's a point in the book where I say, you know, this idea of scolding contemporary athletes amounts to a kind of paternalistic wish that your children had it badly off as, has, had it as badly as you once did, right? It's not unlike, right, sort of a cranky old, you know, the cranky old parent who says, well, in my day, this is what it was like, right? And that to me is sort of the biggest issue. Sure, Jackie Robinson and Kurt Flood make Michael Jordan possible. Michael Jordan wants to sell sneakers. He doesn't want to involve himself in a political campaign, right, in North Carolina, right? So if, if, if that's the case, Right? If, if Jackie Robinson and Kurt Flood make Michael Jordan possible, right, and we were celebrating Jackie Robinson and Kurt Flood for making Michael Jordan possible, why now are we scolding Michael Jordan for refusing to put everything at risk right, that presumably Jackie Robinson and Kurt Flood allowed him to achieve? That point, I did see that. I think uh, you have several passages where you talk about that and saying it's almost as as though we wish we could have Michael Jordan at all go back to the 1960s and endure those sort Mm -hmm. of indignities uh, and what have you. Uh, And then them not having those indignities would have a big influence on what they're going to be talking about, what they're going to be feeling motivated to to speak to, talk about that sort of thing. Um, I guess also in that in that same vein, Jack, I think this would also be uh, relevant. Did I misread? I think you also point out that Jackie Robinson also got quite a bit of criticism where people said, I would almost say some similar things to him that we now, some people at least say about Michael Jordan in terms of him being a sellout or you're not doing what you should be doing in terms of helping the black, black people and addressing racism correctly. Is that accurate? Yeah, in 1969, when Harry Edwards wrote his book, he called Jackie Robinson America's infinitely patient Negro. That's what he wrote in Revolt of the Black Athlete. Uh, and certainly, I mean, there were, there were all sorts of folks. I mean, but keep in mind, Jackie Robinson's case, in, in that sense, might even be unique, because by the time the 1960s had rolled around, you know, Jackie Robinson's playing career was over. 
uh, and he was out, you know, campaigning for Nelson Rockefeller. He actually uh, helped, he gave Richard Nixon his support when Richard Nixon was running against Jack Kennedy in 1960. Uh, and so, you know, the fact that Jackie Robinson was a Republican, went to the 1964 Republican National Convention, all this, right, this, for many, for many black folks who were taking radicalizing terms in the late 1960s, Jackie Robinson was an athena. Right. Um, nonetheless, I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I can ask my, you know, a room full of 30 students who Jackie Robinson is, and I'm going to get approximately the same story, right? An American hero. That's who Jackie Robinson is. Uh, and so, sure, Jackie Robinson was, was called out by many of his contemporaries. He got into a big spat with, uh, with Malcolm X on the pages of the New York Amsterdam News in 1963. Um, in 1963, uh, Adam Clayton Powell had given a speech uh, in which he questioned the wisdom of putting white folks in charge of the NAACP uh, and other civil rights organizations. Uh, and, you know, Malcolm X had, uh, uh, and, and, and basically what happened was Jackie Robinson then wrote a column in the New York Amsterdam News where he, uh, he sort of questioned Powell's uh, wisdom, right? He basically said, you know, Powell doesn't know what he's talking about. In order to accomplish what I've accomplished, I've had to for forge important coalitions with white folks. I'm proud to call all these white folks my friends and everything else. Uh, and, and then he, and then he sort of like almost gratuitously threw Malcolm X in there, right? Malcolm X had done personally nothing to provoke Jackie Robinson, but Robinson wrote in this column, he's like, and Malcolm X, you too, right? I mean, you're the, you're the real problem here, right? Uh, and so Malcolm wrote, in, it was November of 1963 in the New York Amsterdam News, Malcolm wrote a reply, right, and basically said, listen, Jackie Robinson, you've been sucking up to your white boss your whole life, so don't tell me how, what, you know, what things are like. You know, you can't tell me, you know, whether or not I speak for the black masses, because let's be honest, between you and me, I'm the one who does, not you, right? Uh, and so then Jackie Robinson sort of made it, uh, he, he spent the next six months, he wrote, I think, two or three follow-up columns where he replied to Malcolm's open letter in the New York Amsterdam News. So there was that spat in 1963, there was the fact that he supported Nelson Rockefeller in 1966 and, you know, and sort of, and beyond, uh, and the fact that he was a Republican. And so, you know, Jackie Robinson certainly took his share of criticism uh, from, uh, from other black folks. Uh, but, you know, as, as the story goes these days, Jackie Robinson is an American hero. And the reason why I tried to link Jackie Robinson, the reason why Jackie Robinson was so important to the argument that I made in my book is that Jackie Robinson helped to create a model for what I uh, call black liberalism, right? And so Jackie Robinson is the shining star. Thou shalt do as Jackie Robinson does, which makes more radical stories, or at least uh, narratives and, and rhetoric that are inflected in kind of a black idiom, much more difficult to tell, right? And so, you know, Harry Edwards led the Olympic Project for Human Rights, led the, tried to lead an Olympic boycott. You know, we got the John Carlos and Tommy Smith salutes in Mexico City in 1968, but by the time 1970, 1972 had rolled around, who Harry, who Harry Edwards was was not a, you know, a black radical hanging with the Panthers in the Bay Area, Harry Edwards was writing seminal works in the sociology of sport, hanging out with academics, right? And so, you know, the, the language of radicalism got confined to academic spaces. It got confined, you know, in a variety of ways. And the, the story of integration sort of rolled on throughout American history, and so that's why I can ask a class of 30 students who's Jackie Robinson, they all can tell me the same story, he's an American hero. Hmm. This is uh, on page 179 uh, to the point that I'm, I think Michael Jordan, a lot of these folks, maybe they have more in common with Jackie Robinson than we initially think. Uh, also, I just, quick pointer, I think, uh, not that I'm encouraged, I think people who listen to the program have heard me say on a consistent basis, I think that's one of the problems with regards to racism, white supremacy, uh, the victims, black people, we end up spending a lot of time uh, fussing amongst ourselves about how we respond to racism. That's something we should be trying to minimize. Uh, I think also with regards to Minister Malcolm X, I think he was very much inspired by Paul Robeson. And I think Jackie Robinson, I think white people, 
used him to speak against Paul Robeson uh, as being an American when they were having their whole Red Scare and, oh, he's a communist and all this for his work against right. racism. I suspect that probably did not win him any cool points uh, with Minister Matt. And I think that is just to also get on the record, I think that's something that Jackie Robinson later greatly regretted. Uh, I think he yeah. talked about that later on in life and, and really feeling bad about being pulled in that. But at any rate. Uh, on 179 of your book, uh, you write that Michael Jordan is not the first, quote unquote, universal man for whom vast swaths of public space has been carved in sport. Neither was Jackie Robinson, who, unlike Jordan, often appears on those proliferant lists of activist athletes. But the history of Robinson's symbolic significance certainly shows that sports universal man has a long and complex history. Beyond having made everyone rich, Flood illustrates this history with compelling difficulty. The history of sports universal man shows tangled junctures and perilous traps for those speaking truth to power. In exhorting athletes to address the public in transformative ways, Roden becomes hostile in his nostalgia for a mode of black political speech that possessed the courage of conviction, but misplaces the very careful and deliberate ways in which black public life turned universal men into its most useful symbolic resources in sport. Roden wondered when Hall of Fame voters would embrace Flood just as Robinson did. Um, I guess, oh, did you have something you want to say or? No, no. Uh, do you have a, uh, it, it, it uh, sounds like you've got a follow-up to that. I did. I was going to get it. Number one, uh, William Roden, mm -hmm. I, j I just heard him, uh, I think two days, or it was the day after the whole blow up with uh, Richard Sherman. They had him on New York Talk Radio. They did not ask him one question about anything mm -hmm. that happened with the rant, the response, nothing. Uh, given what he said about $40 million, I thought that was fascinating to have him uh, at that moment, less than 24 hours after everything, and they didn't ask him one question about all of that. What they did bring yeah. up was, this is Stoner Bowl. Uh, you have two states <laughs> yeah. with teams right. where marijuana, had, they brought that up immediately, and then they just went to X's and O's. Great defensive team, great offensive team, da da da, -da and all that. Not one question about right. all of this flap. I thought that was incredible for many reasons. Um, let me double check, make sure I'm not missing folks who might have a question. If you have a question sure. for Dr. Khan, do not wait uh, until the last moment. Go ahead and get a hand up. If you have a question, the number again, 760-569-7676. And the code is 564-943-POUND. Press star six if you have questions. Um, the next one I wanted to ask as well, uh, I feel like, again, the racism aspect, I feel like with white people, this, if anything, I would hope just the consistency of these sorts of behaviors, whether we're looking 1960s and the way Bill Russell was treated, even by a lot of Boston uh, Celtics fans uh, or purported yeah. fans, uh, all the way up to today with Richard Sherman and what have you, in my view, just that consistency of behavior to me speaks volume uh, and it reveals a lot just about uh, what sports means and I think even Dr. Uh, Hoberman he talked about that a lot when we were on the program just in terms of for many white people the difficulty of I think you would say tolerating enduring uh, black athletes right. in these contests if they're going to be watching uh, sporting events uh, this I wanted to get in your thoughts with Serena Williams as well because uh, I see a lot of it there. This is a sports field where most generally predominantly white, if not all white, maybe they have one or two mm -hmm. uh, black players occasionally. Uh, Indian Wells, uh, it's a tournament that's coming up. I think it's in California. Uh, I think infamously when she was 19, she played there. Mm -hmm. The fans got upset. They felt her, they felt she and her family, uh, Richard Williams, had done something incorrect, either rigging the tournament so that Serena would win or deceiving them by uh -huh. saying that Venus Williams was injured when they didn't think she was. I think part of it was that the announcement was made very late that Venus Williams was injured. And so she wasn't going to be playing at any rate, for whatever reason, they felt that uh, they had cheated or had done something incorrect. And so they booed her the entire match. Uh, she was out playing for the championship and they, and I mean, they booed everything. They booed when she made faults, errors, uh, <laughs> things that never had. I mean, for folks, tennis is normally uh, prim proper, uh, very much about uh, 
conducting yourself with uh, extreme manners and not yelling. This is not get a beer and come out and just act like a fool. Uh, and they hooted, yelled. There were black people who commented who were in the stands who said that they felt unsafe uh, because it was such a tense racist environment to have thousands of white fans shouting at this 19 year old girl. Uh, she has not played at this tournament since that time. It's been, I think 12, it might even be 13 years at this point since she played the tournament. Uh, every year this comes up and they ask, are you going to go back? She says, no, it's now a required event and she's still not going. Uh, there was an article uh, that was published last week. Uh, it was written by Jessica Luther. Uh, it's called Return to Indian Wells, where she wrote the following. I wanted to hear your thoughts. Uh, she says, following her third round win over Danila uh, Henchova, if I'm saying it correctly, a reporter asked Serena Williams about Nelson Mandela and Indian Wells, saying Mandela's message was pretty much forgiveness and reconciliation. Do you think that spirit could affect your thoughts about what happened in the desert? There is a new generation of people who would love to see you there. Would that ever cross your mind as a possibility? Probably to the most to most people's surprise, she said yes. Yeah, it actually crossed my mind a couple days ago or after I saw the movie. Thus begins Indian Wells Watch 2014. Uh, I'll stop there. Uh, do you have any thought? I don't know if you follow tennis, if you're familiar with this, but do you have any, any thoughts about this, particularly them using the, uh, the memory of Mandela to try to motivate her to return to this event? Well, um, I mean, I, I don't follow tennis, so it's, it's hard for me to say. Although I think I, I think I'm getting what you're, I, I think I'm picking up what you're getting at. Um, the, uh, okay, so the, one of the points that I make in the book and one of the things that is sort of always at least simmering beneath the surface for me as I, as I write about issues related to race and sports is the problem of symbolic representation. Uh, and this is something that Manning Marable defines as what he calls it's the, he says that he calls it the theoretical guiding star of inclusionism. Uh, and the idea is, is that, um, a, you know, uh, is that a single, a single black voice can speak for all black folks. And Jackie Robinson, for me, becomes, uh, in sports, kind of the model for how symbolic representation works. Like, we want to know what black people think, let's ask Jackie Robinson. Right. Uh, and uh, this is right the the idea of symbolic representation. This is why I, I sort of I took care to kind of define uh, black liberalism as a type of talk that deals with diversity, tolerance, and inclusion. Because the idea is is that you know no matter what institution you are running, right, when it comes to racial matters, and it it it, it certainly applies to uh, uh, it applies to blackness and these days, increasingly in American culture, political culture, it applies to whether you are Spanish speaking. Um, it, uh, the idea is, is that, you know, you got an institution, you include a face that looks like that, right? And then that face, right, or the body that, right, the body that has that face gets to speak on all matters related to race. And this is essentially what happens with with, with Venus Williams, I mean, you know, sort of invoking the movie about Nelson Mandela, the death of ne Nelson Mandela, if we shall return to uh, uh, a tennis tournament, right, is essentially a way of kind of invoking this politics of this logic of symbolic representation that says, that says, okay, uh, you spoke for, you spoke for black people in this particular way, right, but now that, uh, you know, this other symbolic repre uh, representative has, you know, uh, offered us this, are you going to agree, <laughs> right? Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a not, an, uh, uh, I'm going to use a double negative here. It is a not unpredictable logic. How about that? Hmm. Why not just say it's a predictable form of logic? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fine, too. Hmm. It's, uh... Fascinating. I have found that pattern a lot. That's something that I call it when you say the, what you call the symbolic representation. I have mm -hmm. found that white people do that a lot. It, even one of our listeners brought it up, your reference uh, with uh, Dr. Manning. The, they will consistently use a black person or non-white person who's deceased, uh, which makes it, in my view, it makes it even more difficult because if they happen to, re if, let's take Mandela, let's say you don't, you don't agree with his stance on that. It makes it doubly difficult because now not only are you 
in argument with another black person or another non-white person who is generally not present, now you're also arguing with someone who's dead. Uh, so that even adds another level to it. Like, oh man, now it makes it seem like I'm stomping on this person's legacy and all of that. I found that this happens consistently. Uh, I found it on yeah. personal levels when I have conversations uh, with white people about racism and we don't agree on something, which is fine. Uh, but they will consistently cite a dead black person to refute something that I've said. So it put, I mean, I've just, and I've said that to them, you're putting me in this position where now I have to disagree with this dead venerated, but it'll be a black person who's published like 50 books and uh, it'll be a James Baldwin or France Fanon or minister, anybody, any dead black person they can think of. Uh, so that now you're disagreeing with this person. I found that that is a very, I think it's strategic. As you said, it, it is a, I would say a predictable pattern mm -hmm. of racist logic, racist, racist behavior. Uh, to try to obstruct thinking arguments that reveal truth about racism, white supremacy, to just have this symbolic representation frequently of a dead, at least a non-white person who is not yeah. physically present uh, for you to get in some sort of argument with this representation of what they said or reported to have said. Uh, I did see we had at least. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, I was just going to, I mean, there's a, there's sort of a strain contained there in your thinking that I want to, uh, I want to sort of agree with. I gave a, I gave a presentation one time to a group of about uh, 75 college students, and I was asked to give a talk on diversity. And I don't remember, it, 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 it kills me now that I can't remember the specifics of the example, but I think you're going to know uh, kind of what I'm talking about. And w the first thing I said was, you know, you've all, you've all been taught that diversity, tolerance, and inclusion are very important things. Uh, and I said, but have we considered the ways in which diversity often lies? And uh, what I showed them was, and this is the example that I'm having trouble remembering specifically, but I showed them a speech that was being given, a political speech, a campaign speech, that was being uh, given by a white Southern Republican politician. And, uh, the, you know, when campaign speeches are given, oftentimes there are crowds, of, right, uh, an audience crowd sort of behind the speaker. When, so when the camera focuses on the, on the speaker, you can see the crowd behind the speaker. And in this case, uh, the, 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 the politician who was doing the speaking, uh, either him or his handlers had, had positioned four people behind him. Right, and so the four people behind him were uh, it was uh, an Asian man, a white woman, a white man, and a black man. Right, and so what you had then was this sort of very traditionally conservative kind of old school Southern politician, you know, uh, making his case to voters right with this image of diversity right behind it, right, They're literally framing his face. Uh, and that, to me, is one of the things that we ought to be suspicious of when it comes to the way that diversity gets sort of bandied about as a buzzword within our institutions. Yes, I mean, look, diversity is good, at least to the extent that it produces actually diversity of opinion, diversity of viewpoint, diversity of outlook, right, increasing levels of contestation and debate and, you know, potentially something that's potentially transformative. But when what diversity does is provide a kind of, uh, a, a non-racist rubber stamp for, a, you know, kind of a, a, a recoded or a refashioned, right, sort of retrenchment or, you know, regression back into old racist ways of thinking, then diversity is literally meaningless. Mm. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, the folks who dialed in, make sure I don't miss our callers. Uh, Lashes, if you had a question for Dr. Abraham Khan, your line should be open. Hi, hi good evening. Um, <clears throat> to, the, to the guests, hi, I'm sorry for my voice. But um, uh, when you mentioned nationalism, integration, and transformation, and how it coincides with black liberalism, did you get that adaptation from Manny Marable himself, like his work, or is that your own adaptation of what black liberalism is? No, it's a, it's from his work, um, and uh, I mean he's got a he's got a he's got a number of of works in which he kind of advances a similar set of categories. Uh, but the one that I, I would I would argue is kind of most that applies the most to the one that I find myself most frequently citing is a work called Beyond Black and White. And I, I, I want to say that that book was written in 
Uh, that book was published in 1995. And in fact, what that book is, is a collection of essays that he had previously written that were all sort of, you know, that were just collected into one volume. Um, let's see if I can find it. It's right here in front. Well, I don't see it immediately in, in front of me. But the book is, oh, here it is. It's called Beyond Black and White. It's published by Verso Press. And it was published in 1995. Uh, and I would say that the... Uh, that the key chapter is the last one. It's called History and Black Consciousness, the Political Culture of Black America. And it is in that chapter where he lays out this distinction between, um, between uh, integration or inclusion, black nationalism, and transformation. Um, with that thought, um, would you say that the same three, uh, I would say three of evolution here, Nationalism, mm -hmm. integration, transformation will also <clears throat> apply to race and white supremacy, but under the following, nationalism, integration, instead of transformation, we will use the term word refinement. Would you say mm -hmm. that also mirrors how racism and white supremacy operates in your field of study or rhetoric? Well, I'd have to ask a little bit more about what you mean by refinement. Refinement, like for example, when you say trans, well, when you mentioned transformation, how Manny Marable mentioned how uh, black liberal thought went from nationalism to integration to transformation, meaning mm -hmm. how we're supposed to transcend race, I guess you could say. But if for under the system of white supremacy, would you say that nationalism, integration, and refinement kind of it highlighted on? It highlights on what you just said previously and you were describing diversity, where mm -hmm. if diversity doesn't really um, showcase various thoughts, communication skills, ex mm -hmm. viewpoints, et cetera, et cetera, but instead mm -hmm. it reverts back into uh. the, the racist, ide like racist ideology of mm -hmm. racism and white supremacy, I will use the term refinement to, re to okay. reference that um, so-called... Uh, example you gave in describing when diversity fails. So I want to know from your perspective, would you see that same dynamic or setup functioning in racism and white supremacy in regards to rhetoric? Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big question and a, and a difficult one. And um, uh, I don't, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put myself in the perilous position here of trying to uh, translate, or at least trying to um, uh, speak on behalf of Manning Marable, which is something that I, I fear because it's, uh, I'm not sure that I can uh, adequately do the work justice. But when, when Marable talks about transformation, it's not necessarily a matter of transcending race or getting beyond it or moving toward what many are today calling a post-racial society. For Marable, Marable was uh, very much a Marxist. Okay, so uh, Marable's view was that transformation was the type of kind of political philosophy that might operate within black America that would connect issues of race to issues of economic injustice and class relations. And so transformation, and this is why uh, the kind of the, the shifting thought of Malcolm X and Martin Luther to the end of their lives provide a very kind of useful um, illustration of what I think he meant by transformation, which is that, you know, Malcolm X came to sort of uh, dismiss or at least sort of rethink all of the sort of very dogmatic opinions he had about the so-called white devil, right? And that sort of opened him up to starting to, to be able to forge political coalitions, right, with uh, white folks who may have sort of had similar arguments about the deep patterns of economic injustice that troubled Malcolm. And on the other hand, right, uh, Martin Luther King had sort of lost that impulse to be worried about being called a communist all the time, right, and started to speak out against Viet the Vietnam War, started to speak uh, on matters of, uh, of economic injustice. And so there was sort of this, almost like this, this barely visible thread where the two were sort of beginning to come together and they were, they were, they were literally using the idiom of race, right, or the language of race to transform society. 
as opposed to simply right in, in including you know different looking faces into the social structures of the social systems that are already there and so I guess what I would say is that the idea, I wouldn't necessarily equate the idea of transformation to what I think you're calling refinement, right, which is making racism work smoother or more efficiently, but instead transformation means using the language of race or the idiom of race or the vocabularies of race in order to highlight and start to combat patterns of deep economic injustice in U.S. society. Okay. <clears throat> My next question would be... Um, uh, based on your work, um, why did you take an interest in African American athletes in a historical perspective in regards to sports, and tying it in and weaving it in with rhetoric, the study of rhetoric? Well, that's a that's a that's a good question, and that's a, uh, I appreciate that question because it's it's sort of biographical. Um, and it's really sort of the, at least from my point of view, kind of the accidents of history. Um, when, uh, when I went to graduate school and I knew that what I wanted to do was, was, uh, was be a scholar, you know, when, you, when you're in grad school, you've got to start picking things uh, because you can't study everything all the time. And uh, I, was, I was in graduate school to study rhetoric, so that sort of came first. Um, but then I found myself uh, immersed uh, by virtue of a course in the works of Malcolm X. And I'm going to give a shout here. I don't know. He may even be listening. Uh, there's a professor at uh, Florida State University named Davis Hauk who is essentially responsible for the fact that I started reading Malcolm X. And I became fascinated by the work of the, not just, not, not just the kind of the influence or the memory or the legacy, but by the actual arguments, right, the ideas being advanced by Malcolm X, uh, particularly uh, in, the, in the year or so before his death, 1964, 19, uh, 1963, 1964, 1965, um, I became vastly interested in that because what Malcolm did was offer a challenge, I mean, a real kind of principled and fully developed challenge to uh, a kind of almost a, a stale logic of black liberalism that I found almost, uh, that I found to be incredibly ineffective. And... Um, and then when I, when I went on to a, a Ph.D. program, I was fortunate to be influenced by a professor named Kurt Wilson, who uh, had me uh, as a teaching assistant in a class called African American Civil Rights Rhetoric, where I had a, uh, a sort of a full, uh, a full education on the range of uh, black rhetoric in the United States going back to uh, the colonial era. Uh, all the way to the present. That's actually where I was first exposed to the work of Manning Marable. Uh, and when it came time to write a doctoral dissertation and actually earn my degree, I, I basically just decided that it was important to write about something that you cared about, that you were interested in, that you regard that I regarded myself to be an expert in, instead of trying to kill myself about writing about something boring. So I figured I have this background and deep knowledge in the uh, uh, tradition of African American public address, and so I uh, wrote about sports, wrote about athletes, and Kurt Flood became incredibly interesting to me because everybody says he's so important, but nobody can exactly figure out why. So uh, I hope that's a very long-winded answer to your question, but I hope it answered it. Yes. Um, my, <clears throat> my final question would be, um, do you have any Caribbean roots? I'm sorry, do I have any Caribbean what? Roots. Roots, roots. yes. N no, not that I know of. Okay. So that's why maybe you were like from like uh, Guyana, for example, or my my next guess would have been Pakistan. So that's why I. Asked. Yeah. No. I'm. Uh, uh, this this question was asked of me uh, at the beginning, uh, and uh, I'm a uh, I'm the product of a Pakistani immigrant and a white woman. Okay. Cool. Thank you so much. I do appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Bye. Uh, the person that dialed in, I uh, guess you're on the free HD line. If you had a question, your line should be open. Caller with a hand up, you're on the free HD line. Did you have a question? Yes, Gus. Greetings. Am I being heard? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Greetings to you, Gus, and greetings. Is this Dr. Khan? Is that his yes, name? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Greetings to you as well. I have Hello. a compound. <laughs> yes, I have a compound question. My first question is to use a compounded question. And it has to do with diversity and tolerance because I keep hearing that word being tossed around a lot on this call. 
Can you give me, tell me what your definition is when you're talking about diversity and tolerance? What is your definition of those two? Well, um, I mean, the, the reason why I sort of, um, why I appreciate being asked what I meant by rhetoric at the very beginning is because, you know, rhetoric is the study of the various ways in which how we put things matter. And uh, I guess I'm not, I don't, I, uh, this is might be seem like it might seem like a weaselly answer, like I'm trying to get out of something. But uh, I don't necessarily have a definition of diversity that kind of works for me, right? Or the idea that you know diversity and tolerance. Uh, this is what I, I absolutely think they are. These are the authentic meanings of tolerance and diversity. I think that tolerance and diversity are terms that are used to authorize a, a variety of political practices. And I guess I would say that I am in agreement. With uh, or social and political practices, I'm in agreement with the social and political practices uh, when it comes to tolerance and diversity. When tolerance and, and diversity are used uh, as mechanisms for social change or revealing things that, uh, that maybe hadn't been revealed before, but when uh, diversity, such as let's include different different faces, right? Uh, when diversity is used as a trick, right? So as to put a kind of moral rubber stamp on that which already exists, I find that problematic. And when tolerance presumes that we, we, right, we, we, find, we find the other objectionable, but we will merely tolerate that person, I find that problematic as well, right? But when tolerance means we ought to start listening where maybe we weren't listening before, I find that very important and very useful. And when diversity means that we should include more, vice, more voices so that we can listen to those voices and open ourselves to change, I find that very useful as well. Okay, so you are going from a rather broad definition based on different aspects of different things as it fits is what you're saying yeah i mean i think that different institutions um use the terms diversity and tolerance in different ways and as a rhetorical scholar my job is to discover the ways in which different institutions and different speakers use those terms in their own contexts but you don't have any of your on your own as to how it is that you view diversity or tolerance um, I mean, I've, I've used the words diversity and tolerance before, but again, in a variety of different contexts and for different purposes. Okay. Question, the next question that I have has to do with the, 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 re, the rewriting of the narrative when it comes to um, Minister Malcolm X and Dr. King. Because I, I get this all the time with people always liking, trying to say that, Malcolm changed to become this kind of gentler person. He was, the white man was no longer the devil. He was seeing mm -hmm. them differently. And mm -hmm. Dr. King, in his later years, Dr. King so-called became inhabited with the spirit of the older Ma Malcolm while he was still in the nation of Islam. That is what I'm getting. But I see this as a rewriting of a narrative in order to fit a script for these individuals. They are trying to tone them down because Malcolm did not change. What Malcolm was doing in the OAU, the Organization of African Unity, yeah. at the time leading up to his assassination, was he was trying to get a coalition to take the case for, of the African Americans to the UN in order to get reparation. That's what he was doing. So he did not change his stance on how he viewed white people. He was just being more diplomatic. And people are taking that to say that, okay, he, he, he completely changed. I well, say well, well, let's, okay, I, I just, I just want to interject there for a second, because I, I, I agree with you 100%, but what I want to do is sort of explore uh, the, the meaning of what you said about being diplomatic, right? Because the idea of being diplomatic was, for Malcolm X, a fundamental change in his speech. Now, as to his character or what was in his brain, I don't know, and I don't know anyone who does know, right? But what we can view is a marked difference in the way he began to talk, right? And the idea of being diplomatic, right? Well, that's, a, that's, that's an important move. And the question is, what lesson ought we derive from the idea that Malcolm decided to become diplomatic? Um, correct. Being diplomatic means to say that, okay, you're no longer screaming and hollering, in order to get your point across, you are doing it in a much more muted tone. 
and that is what Malcolm was doing. He toned down his rhetoric, rhetoric from this fiery fire and brimstone stance that he had more to a more diplomatic means because if you want to be taken out have an organization a worldwide organization instead of where he started off it was just a local united states based organization that he was running now it's on yeah. a global level and he's going to be pushing this across the globe you have to change your stance and the way how you speak and that is what yeah. malcolm did he did not change his views of how he view us because i've heard his daughters and um, make speech to say that a lot of times they said their father had to walk the street because when he got to thinking of the condition of his people and what they were in, it brought tears to his eyes and it brought so much anger to him. He had to walk the streets in order to calm down. So I would not say that, you know, this is how this is the rewriting of the script, just like they did with, with um, Madiba, Nelson Mandela, as they call him trying to make him stuck okay he was this reconciliation person he wants to reconcile he was no longer the angry um, black man he wanted to forgive and want everyone to hug and just can we all get along no, no right no no but, I, don't, but, I don't think that's true and i don't, I don't I'm but that sure is what that... is being pushed in the media because as you just mentioned with a young lady in the article and talking about what she told serena trying to bring um Madiba in and say okay well he was this man all about forgiveness and reconciliation trying to con her well why don't you just be like him he was so mag magnanimous why don't you take a picture a chapter out of his book and do the same thing and come back to um and to engine wells and play the game that's a that's that's a, that's a terrific point especially as it applies to serena williams but uh i guess the the only the only uh kind of the, the, only, the only way that i might sort of walk what you said back uh from my own perspective is, and keep in mind that i come from this uh, I, I come to this from the perspective of a rhetorical scholar. And what a rhetorical scholar pays attention to is what people say. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that nobody knows, right, at least, right, I, the reason that, what, that I pay attention to what people say is because I don't know what's in anybody's head. And I don't think anybody knows what's in anybody's head. So to say that Malcolm X did or didn't change his views claims access to his brain. And I don't sure. think we have that access to his brain. What we can measure is what he said. What we can view, what we can, what we can analyze is what he said. Uh, and, you know, for Malcolm X to become diplomatic in the last year of his life in order to forge a coalition to take the United States to the, uh, to the, to the United Nations, right, on either charges of crimes against humanity or in search of reparations or whatever else, right, what, what lesson can we derive from the idea that in order to achieve that type of social change, or in order to achieve that type of outcome, that diplomatic speech is necessary. And, you know, I don't, I don't know what Malcolm X was thinking between 1964 and 1965. I don't think anyone else knows what Malcolm X was thinking before 1964 and 1965. But what I can do is mark the differences in the way Malcolm was speaking in 1962 and the way Malcolm was speaking in 1964. That, that's I have one more question. That is quite true because no, none of us are mind readers and we can only go by the tone of a speech or the written word as put on paper as to what mm -hmm. the individual might have been thinking and try and read between the lines, so to speak. But right. that is something that I have to give pushback on because people always bring that up saying, oh, he went to Mecca. And he saw white people and all these other different people and he became this change man all of a sudden he fell in love with white people and they they're no longer yeah. the devil no right. that that is very that's a that's a very simplification thing of trying to take this person and make them into this um santa claus version because they, they, they tried it with they, they almost they completed with dr king but they couldn't complete it with with, with malcolm they had him stuck with that part about the white man was no longer the devil and he was became this kind of gentler person and it kind of got stuck there. My last question for you have to do with, since we're talking about sports, what is your take about this debacle with the um, Dennis Rodman, the Goodwill <laughs> tour that went to the, the Democratic Republic of North Korea and uh -huh. how the media basically rolled them under the bus, the train and everything else that was moving and created this division between these 10 male athletes and tried to get them to basically cannibalize each other to try and yeah. save themselves. What, what, what is your take on that? <laughs> That's, uh, wow. I, uh, of all the things I thought I, I thought I might be asked tonight, Dennis Rodman was the furthest from my <laughs> mind. So I appreciate that. 
Um, that's, uh, I don't know. I honestly don't know, and I'd have to spend some time thinking about it. Um, Dennis Rodman, I, I'll, I'll confess here, I grew up in uh, Chicago. I uh, uh, spent most of my life, uh, I, 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 I didn't leave Chicago until I was 24 years old, and then, uh, then I moved to Florida and moved kind of all over the east coast of the U.S. Uh, and for me, Dennis Rodman is complicated. For me, it's very difficult with Dennis Rodman to get past the idea that he is a kind of a, it's, it's kind of like some, one of the things we were saying about Richard Sherman earlier, right? He is a, he's sort of a brilliant trickster, right? Dennis Rodman is a guy who always knows how to insert himself into a conversation. Okay. And it is both, uh, it is both a virtue and a vice. And, um, and the reason I, I have to sort of confess that I'm from Chicago is for me, what I see Dennis Rodman as, and what I will kind of always see Dennis Rodman as, is the greatest rebounder in the history of basketball. <laughs> <laughs> and so the fact that he's going to North Korea and the fact that, right, there's this sort of bizarre, and, and I, I mean, you know, and, and, you know, I don't, I don't mean to, to diminish kind of the race politics that might surround Dennis Rodman, but for me, the fact that Dennis Rodman is, uh, is traveling to North Korea is, 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 is as, as I think, uh, our host put it earlier, right? It's it's a, it's a kind of racial theater of the highest order, right? It's a, it's an absurdity of the absurd, right? It, it's, it's just kind of the whole thing is strange to me, but I appreciate the question because it's something that I I, I ought to really think more deep, deeply about. Okay, but what? How do you think of what the media had look of it? Um, have you had a chance to look at any of the interview tapes by Pierce Morgan, Anderson Cooper, as well as Christiana Amanpour and? Mm -hmm. Have you listened no, to any of the dialogue? I haven't. I haven't. Although um, I suppose the first thing that I would do before, um, well, not necessarily before, but maybe in tandem with, there is a, a really good book by a man named I want to say his name is Damian Lewis. Um, it, it's a recent book. It came out last year, uh, 2013, and I, I kind of want to alert you to it. Uh, it's called Globe Trotting. That's the name of the book, Globe Trading. I think the author's name is, is Damian Lewis. Uh, and this book details, uh, chapter by chapter, the various ways in which the U.S. State Department mm -hmm. took, advantage of, uh, took advantage of black athletes in order to make their case to the international community yes, about the progressive... You, you, you've read Globe Trading. Okay, good. Uh, yes, the, the Goodwill Ambassadors that they have used and musicians yes. as well. Right. Yeah, and I guess the thing that, that I would do is, uh, if I were to examine the Rodman case closely, I'd have that book very close to me. Okay, well, um, well, thank you very much for trying to um, attempt to answer a question that was not on the menu. But I do appreciate I do appreciate the dialogue and you know everything that you have been saying so far in regards to sports and basically how it has been used as a weapon. One other thing, if I may quickly, you were speaking about Kurt Flood and what yeah. he did, what he did for sports and everything else, and how these athletes did not show up at his homegoing funeral when he transitioned. Who were the white athletes that showed up? All big name white athletes that were at his um, homegoing. Were oh, Pete boy, Rose or any one of those? Did any of them show up to his homegoing? Uh, Mark yeah, McGuire? I don't really remember that. The, the people that the people that showed up at, at Kurt Flood's funeral were his playing contemporaries. Kurt Flood's closest friend on the team, according to what I've read, uh, was the, the the famous and dominant um, Cardinal pitcher Bob Gibson. Mm -hmm. And so, folks like Bob Gibson was there. Marvin Miller, who was in charge of the players' union at the time, was there. Um, and so, right, the the folks who were at his funeral was a wide variety of of Flood's own contemporaries. Um, and so, right, there were there were a number of athletes and other sports figures there. It's just that there weren't any. Uh, contemporary. So Kurt Flood died. I want to say in 1997, and uh, when Kurt Flood died in 1997, there were no athletes who were active in 1997 who had attended the funeral. But um, uh, it was uh, it was it was a well attended funeral nonetheless by a number mm -hmm. of people that Kurt Flood played with. Oh, okay. Because why I say that? Because I got a little um, antsy when you were making um, like Shaquille and these other players. Go. Oh, that wasn't me. I was quoting someone. I'm sorry. That wasn't oh, me. I was quoting oh, okay. someone who was, okay. who was saying that. And okay, I was I criticizing apologize. their position. Yeah. Okay, I do apologize because I was going to say, if they're going to say these black athletes who benefited from him, how about the white athletes? Because what he did, yeah. 
everyone benefit um for mo them more so than the black athletes and i would think like a pete rose and all, all of those others they would have been there to um yeah. to show the man some kind of a support but thanks again you you know great show gus i mute myself <laughs> thank you Right on, right on. <laughs> yeah, I thought I thought that was one thing that I did uh, greatly appreciate. I, I felt like he uh, offered some great logic to uh, combating that tendency to criticize uh, younger, at current contemporary athletes, black athletes, uh, for whatever. Not talking about racism or not knowing enough about Kurt Flood or whomever else they think they should be talking about or, or doing. I appreciated that from the book. Uh, I guess before uh, we let you go, since you are in Florida... Yep. Uh, I did want to ask, um, I've heard all this talk about, you know, we, this nostalgia, as you say in the book, for this bygone era of when there were athletes mm -hmm. who did speak up and talked about racism and had real issues as opposed to just trying to sell us sneakers or Gatorade or whatever mm -hmm. else. Uh, we had that this year. Jonathan Martin, right in your area. He did speak up. Yeah. He said something about racism and I don't yeah. think he got tons of support and right on. Yeah, that's what we needed. Uh, can yeah. I get your comment on that before you exit? Yeah, it, certainly. Um, the Jonathan Martin uh, situation is interesting, and I closely followed it um, kind of as it was immediately evolving. I think that story broke in, like, September or October. Um, and I, I followed it for a little while, and then the story kind of went away, and I kind of remembered it. But there's actually a story today. Uh, on the front page of ESPN.com, and ESPN apparently was reporting that, you know, supposedly the texts that Martin sent back to Richie Incognito were just as vile as the texts that Incognito sent to Martin, and, you know, and it's, and it becomes a sort of this strange game of, you know, who's the, who's the bigger, who's the bigger jerk, or who's the bigger bully, and, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know, and I, I didn't actually, I didn't read the article carefully enough to be able to, to say anything uh, particularly intelligent about it, but, um, I, I did. I, I was. I did sort of pay attention to, to to Jonathan Martin because I think you're right. The Jonathan Martin case is interesting. Jonathan Martin is, I think, the person that the media and I, I, I don't want to go on a, another tangent. I think about Richard Sherman, but uh, jo Jonathan Martin is the person. Another Stanford guy, right? Jonathan Martin is the person that the media is trying to invoke about Richard Sherman when they defend him. Right, so when they say that Richard Sherman has a Stanford education, he's a really bright guy, he writes a column for Sports Illustrated, blah, 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 right, what they're trying to say is, no, no, deep down, Richard Sherman is really, right, the sensitive and thoughtful Jonathan Martin. Right, but I, but I also want to say this, um, because uh, one of the things, right, keep in mind that the, that the manuscript for my book, I submitted the manuscript of my book uh, to the University Press of Mississippi in the summer of 2010. And I also want to point out that a lot has changed since then. I think that you're right to point out Jonathan Martin, and uh, but there are a number of other cases. I mean, uh, another another just wonderful case that got so little media coverage, it was depressing, was the case of a Virginia, University of Virginia football player named Joseph Williams. I don't know if you heard about Joseph Williams, but, but Joseph Williams um, stood in solidarity with um, with union workers at the University of Virginia, basically the, the staff labor, the minimum wage labor that works at the University of Virginia, and carried on a 14-day hunger strike. Right? He was a walk-on football player for the University of Virginia whose scholarship was in peril. In fact, his position on the team was in peril. And uh, rather than, you know, he, he took a particular class or whatever, a class in politics or a class in political science or whatever, and he decided that the right thing to do would be to stand in solidarity with the racialized minimum wage workers uh, at the University of Virginia. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know, you know, um, you know, what the, what, what the status is with Jason Collins is right now, but Jason Collins stands as sort of another example of an athlete who is sort of trying to resurrect the ath activist athlete mold and adapt it to contemporary times. And I think that there are a variety. Jonathan Martin, Joseph Williams, um, uh, Jonathan Martin, Joseph Williams, uh, uh, Jason Collins, and, and a number of others who, a number of other contemporary athletes who are sort of, I think, bringing back what we might in a few years call a kind of second golden era of the activist athletes. So I don't want to sort of leave on an entirely pessimist, pessimistic note or on, an, on a note that says that the, that the, the purveyors of nostalgia have had the last word and, you know, Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods are the definitive black athletes of our times. But I, I, don't, I don't think that's the case. Eton Thomas, Dave Zirin has, 
uh, written extensively about Etan Thomas, who's another, I think, individual, uh, Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, who protested the singing of the national anthem several years ago. I mean, there, there, there are plenty of examples to draw from. It's just that these examples don't get the type of coverage and um, kind of media interest that perhaps they deserve. Excellent point. I, I wanted to point out quickly because I've mentioned uh, Jason Collins before. In fact, I contrasted Jason Collins with Jonathan Martin. Uh, mm-hmm. I did not see one person, uh, not one article that had anything bad to say about Jason Collins. Everything. Yeah. Even he said it was overwhelmingly supportive. Uh, yeah. where they had nothing but great things to say and wishing him well. And he's not even playing. He's not even on a basketball team right now. He wasn't at the time that he made his announcement. He's not now. Um, nothing but great things to say with Jonathan Martin. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even the example that you did just gave about Joseph Williams, even though he's at the collegiate level, a lot less mm-hmm. attention on that. As you said, a lot of people didn't even know about it. I didn't know about that until you mentioned it. Uh, with mm-hmm. Jonathan Martin, I saw a lot of pushback when you said earlier in the program that you felt like some of the anti-racist machinery went to work to immediately defend Richard Sherman. That did not happen uh, with Jonathan Martin. It was a lot of, no, yeah. you got to be tough to play football. Sounds like you're not really right. man enough to do this. Uh, oh, J- what did, what, yeah, I, I think what happened there was it linked up with the kind of pre-existing script about bullying in American culture. Right? I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of talk about bullying in our schools and everything else. And what happened with the Jonathan Martin case was that the facts seemed to align with that kind of pre-existing narrative about bullying. Uh, and, you know, certainly there's a, there's, there's, a, there's a racial dynamic at work there, but I think that if you examine the, the kind of the, if you go back and you look at the articles from ESPN.com, or if you go back and you look at the articles on Deadspin and even the work of Dave Zirin, um, what you're going to see is that the Jonathan Martin case got caught up in uh, kind of got ensnared by a discourse on bullying that has to do with Facebook and, and everything else uh, that's been kind of going on for the past year or so. I think that's true. But the point that I said kind of repeatedly, if this had been Jason mm-hmm. Collins and it was the same mm-hmm. thing, somebody was saying, I'm going to put my penis in your mouth and all the other things mm-hmm. that he was saying, I think it would mm-hmm. have been a radically different response. And I think that that mm-hmm. speaks a volume to the difference sure. when things, when issues come up that are related to racism, as opposed to yeah. when issues come up related to what is called homosexuality, white people have a very different interest and a very different way of talking about and defending homosexuality as opposed to racism. And I think that goes back to what I said about the dedication. Uh, I think Jason Collins, it would not have been at all about bullying. It, and even if it was in the rhetoric of quote unquote bullying rhetoric, again, even if it was in the rhetoric of bullying, it still would have been more. It would have been even louder. Bullying is wrong. This shouldn't be happening. And we should be doing more to discourage bullying, even in the NFL. And if that means we need to change the way that we think of manhood, I think that's how the dialogue would have been framed if it had been Jason Collins or anyone else who identified as homosexual, and they reported the same sort of abuse that Jason Collins, excuse me, that Jonathan Martin identified along the lines of race. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe, but, you know, what you're you're driving at is, uh, I think, uh, it's a a body of scholarship, at least uh, the place my mind goes when you you raise the point that you make, is uh, to a body of scholarship uh, that is, it's been... It's been advanced by uh, by people such as Bell Hooks um, on intersectionality, uh, and the idea is that you know race is a form of identity that exists at the intersection with other forms of identity. And I think that you're right that the cultural response to Jason Collins in, during the same type of abuse as Jonathan Martin, I think you're right to say the cultural response response would have been different. Um, but I. I also think that that's, I think, in large part because of the fact that Jason Collins is viewed as existing at the, at the intersection of a different set of identity categories than than Jonathan Martin. Agreed. I will. We will leave it there. Uh, we will perhaps see if we can right. get you uh, back on the program down the road. Uh, the folks, again, if you want to get more information, check out the book, uh, the book that we talked about mostly for this broadcast, uh, Curtis Flood in the media, baseball, race, and the demise of the activist athlete. Uh, great info. Uh, hopefully you'll have more scholarship coming out that we can review. And uh, definitely we'll look forward to having you back on the program in the future, Dr. Khan. 
Absolutely. Thank you very much for your time. Enjoyed it thoroughly. Take excellent care. Okay, you too. Yes, sir. Good All right, bye-bye. Context of white supremacy. Uh, again, Dr. Abraham Kahn, Kurt Flood in the media and other topics. Uh, I've talked about that before. I've said that several times. Uh, I think that is, at least in my view, uh, it shows the agenda that racists have, uh, the importance of advancing uh, all of the LGBT rights and what have you uh, above and beyond everything else. Uh, if Jonathan Martin was gay and he just said they were making these comments, I think it would have been radically different. I don't think they would have been jumping over themselves to get Warren Sapp and all of these other black players, victims, to come out and say that uh, Richie Incognito is a nigger. And, you know, he's that's my guy. We had a great time with him. And he called me. I don't think it would have been any of that. I think it would have been, man. This Richie Incognito dude has got to go like yesterday. And I can't believe we've got a homophobe like this in the NFL. And is this the culture that we've got? I think they would have had PSAs, all kinds of things. I think it would have been a totally uh, different assembly of rhetoric uh, to talk about that incident. Uh, if Jonathan Martin, gay male, or if it had been Jason Collins, even if it had been uh a black male who was making these comments, if it, if it had been uh, Richie Incognito was a black male making these comments to another black male, I think it would have sounded totally different uh, than what we got in just Jonathan Martin saying, hey, I'm a victim of racism. This guy is bullying me and making all these comments. Um, even since he did bring that up with the rhetoric of, of bullying, I would say even go to uh, Tyler Clementi and some of the other, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the other more public incidents where uh, bullying is being talked about. Uh, generally, I hear white people being very much in support of bullying is not cool. I don't ever hear a time where bullying gets talked about and it gets minimized or disregarded. Uh, or if you're a man, you're not supposed to be bullied. I don't I don't hear it get discussed in those terms at all. It's this bullying stuff has got to get met. Every time I go to the library now, I look and they've got new literature. They got brand new shiny books that are talking about bullying and how we should be talking about this with our children. And this is not acceptable and changing this uh this climate of making bullying uh, an acceptable thing. I hear that all the time. I, I could be in error, but that's that's something I would pay attention to. I'm I'm so ashamed. I didn't even know about what happened with Joseph Williams. That's my alma mater. Uh, I had to see if he would be down to come on the program to chat with us. I would be uh, I would thoroughly enjoy hearing uh, if this is a football player, especially who has taken this stance that racism is a problem on campus and he's going to support these black workers on campus. Uh, that is outstanding. Commendations for uh, Mr. Williams. I will get on my job, see if we can get him on the program. Uh, we'll take a uh, quick commercial break. Uh, if we missed the caller, my bad. She got your hand up earlier. I said that. Uh, we'll take a quick commercial break and come back if anybody has anything they want to get in before we wrap things up. We will do so. Just give me a quick three minutes. Context of white supremacy. RacismDaily.com, your number one source for global news reports on race, racism, and overt actions of white supremacy. From Asia to the Americas, to Europe, to Australia, to Africa, racism is not a thing of the past, it is our current reality. Be informed, be globally informed, you should be the first to know. RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? Counterracism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. 
Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. Do you need a one-stop shop for all of your multimedia needs? Triumphant Multimedia is a skilled team of professionals with a passion for great marketing and chic design. Our specialties include consulting, brand development, copywriting, and creative graphic design. That's second to none. We also offer photography, photo retouching, videography, and video editing. At Triumphant Multimedia, our goal is to provide highly effective creative solutions built to suit any individual need or budget. Give us a call at 678-732-8067 or check us out online at TRI Multimedia. Multimedia.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is Justice with the Cows Radio Program. If you want to learn about, understand, and counter racism, white supremacy, be sure not to miss a cow's episode. We keep them jammed, packed with constructive information to sharpen your use of words to help eliminate the system of racism, white supremacy, ASAP. Also, to be able to invest in my counter-racist efforts co-hosting the cow's radio program, please visit my blog, Just Do Justice Today. Just saying, just buckets and buckets of words. I got an uncle real crazy. My uncle B, 55 years old, hates white people, married to a white lady. <laughs> and he sit around going, you know, these crackers ain't shit, except for Susan. <laughs> he tried to explain the whole thing to me one day. Say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a white wife. I love her. She loved me. That's all that matter. But I tell you this: if the revolution ever come, I kill her first. <laughs> Just to show these crackers I mean business. <laughs> motherfucker cracker ass, motherfucker cracker. Shit cracker, motherfucker. But hey, hey, hi, honey. <laughs> motherfucker cracker, I'll kill my cracker kids too. <laughs> We're back now at 7.39 with an NBC exclusive. Jonathan Martin, the NFL player who says he endured bullying in the Miami Dolphins locker room, speaking out for the first time since leaving his team. He sat down for a candid conversation with NBC sports analyst Tony Dungy. Tell me the first thing that happened that, that caused you to feel uncomfortable. It was comments, um, potential comments of a, a racial nature, um, you know, aggressive um, sexual comments related to my sister and my mother. I've spoken to my teammates uh, on other, or former teammates in other locker rooms across the NFL, and you know, I asked, you know, does this stuff go on? Is this normal rookie hazing? And, you know, the consensus was this is not normal. A lot of what I, I'm hearing centers around Richie Incognito. One individual, or was it more than one individual? It was more than one. You know, I think it was the culture. I don't think, uh, you know, there, there's a place to disrespect people in a professional sport. Um, you know, offensive linemen are, you know, uh, like a brotherhood. This started your rookie year. Yeah. Did you feel like you were singled out? Yeah. Do you think you got it more than other guys did? There are other people that got it too. Um, you know, I can't say why um, I may have gotten it more. Um, you know, like I said, you know, I have no problem with the normal um, hazing that you see in the NFL. You get a haircut, you know. Um, Stuff like that, little pranks, but you know, of a personal, you know, attacking nature. I don't think there's any place for that. Did you think about things, or did you talk to anybody after your first year before you started your second year? I did mention, or uh, members of the organization knew that I was struggling. Who did you talk to? I, I had some conversations with uh, my coaches uh, immediately above me. Um, I didn't get into specifics. You're not supposed to, you know, quote unquote, snitch on your teammates. I didn't see it as my place to go above the heads of leaders on the offensive line and talk to my coaches about my teammates. So. You mentioned there was no one specific incident, but at some point during this past season, you started thinking about leaving the team. Tell me what led up to that. You know, it was extending past my rookie season and got to the point where I didn't think things were changing and uh, I had to remove myself from the situation for my own health. Did you ever talk to Coach Philbin about this, your head coach? 
Uh, I did not. You know, I worked hard to be friends with Richie Incognito and others. You know, I think it's important to uh, build these friendships with your teammates. So I turned the microscope back on myself. What am I doing wrong that I'm being treated like this? You know, as an outsider, I see the stories of the text messages going back and forth. They seem friendly. It seems like he's sending you texts. You're sending him a bunch of texts. Um, is that not, you know, the sign of friendship? It is. Like I said, I was trying with all my being to do whatever I could to be a member of this culture and of uh, our unit as offensive line. Have you talked to anybody uh, from the Dolphins since you left? No. What, what are you looking for in, in the next situation? What will be different for you uh, so it doesn't end up like it did in Miami? Well, I understand opportunities in the NFL are fleeting. I, I'm hopeful that I get another opportunity and I'm going to make the most of it because this is what I love to do. I don't know what I would do if I wasn't playing football. Do you think you're ready to come back into this, this environment? I don't think there's any question that I'm ready. How can you assure me? Well, Coach, I'm looking in the eye, and I'm telling you I'm ready to play. You know, I'd be ready to play on Sunday if uh, my team was in the Super Bowl. We reached out to the Dolphins. The team has declined to comment until it gets the results of the NFL's investigation. And after those allegations surfaced, Richie Incognito was suspended by the Dolphins. His representative also declined to comment on our interview. Context of white supremacy, uh, Jonathan Martin, recent comments about what transpired with the Miami Dolphins. Uh, he was being interviewed by Tony Dungy, former head coach of Peyton Manning and the Colts, uh, actually when they won the Super Bowl. I think uh, 2007, if memory serves, uh, he was coaching the team. Uh, at any rate, we will be back tomorrow. I was going to put that tidbit in about uh, them asking Serena Williams uh, if she should go back and play at Indian Wells and couching their question in the rhetoric of Madiba and the reconciliation. And don't you think it would, it would be what he would want? Wasn't he about forgiveness, letting things go, not holding a grudge, moving forward? Like, uh, man, and it just for me further validated the significance of reading the material and not getting caught up in the film because we're only tomorrow we'll only be about halfway through the book and all of the questions and concerns that we've raised about the text uh, just through the halfway point I can only imagine how much worse the film would be uh, if you're taking a book that has been heavily edited redacted white ghostwriter everything else uh, and that's even if you get the uh, unabridged version. I can't imagine what the abridged version would look like. Anywho, uh, and then you take that and the book being the audio book being, I think, 28 hours going to a film that I think is max three hours. I can't even imagine how much material has been omitted and how much worse that would be. So uh, if anything, as Dr. Welsing says all the time, reading is more important than watching television. Absolutely. But uh, I hope people are learning. And uh, that was that that right there, that incident with Serena Williams was the whole spirit of why I wanted to read uh, his autobiography, because I felt like white people, they were going to use uh, the rhetoric surrounding Madiba major ammunition uh, going to be coming at black people everywhere, worldwide, South Africa, here, all over the world. Everything is going to be couched in. Well, what about Madiba? He wouldn't do that. You sound angry. What about Madiba? He endured 27 years in jail. You haven't done all that. If he wasn't angry, why can't you be like that? Hopefully, if you have the text, reading the text, you'll have some great tidbits to be able to successfully combat all that and uh, use your own counter-racist rhetoric. That stood out so much to me. I, it was almost like, man, I would have rather just done a whole program, just talk about that. Like, uh, I think that might have been the first time we had someone who actually, their research interest, what they study, what they write about, talk about, teach about, is in the field of rhetoric. I think that's something that white people do major work. Uh, we should definitely make an effort to uh, compensate, see if we can get some other white people who are in that field on the program. Uh, I'll hit the folks who dialed in. Uh, the people... Who did not get a chance to speak? I guess I'll get you all first, and then everybody else. Your line will be open as well. Uh, quickly, uh, Bruce Fine, her comment about uh, when he was speaking about Dennis Rodman, uh, referencing him as a quote unquote trickster. Uh, she thought that was interesting use of words, uh, referencing a black male. Uh, I'll read her comment specifically, said, so I'm not uh, botching it. Um, she said, uh, There we go. She says, uh, Trickster. There he goes again. This black male is not being used by white people, but
but he is a con art, a con artist, a marketer. He is a trickster to stay in the media and make money. The cerebral slave tricking master. The folks that dialed in, uh, we should have, I think this is our caller in Florida, and our caller at 5321, your lines are open. Uh, We heard from 404 and Lashes. Your lines are open as well, but I just want to make sure we got the folks who hadn't shared yet. Uh, Caller in Florida and 5321, did you all have uh, comments or things you wanted to share? Uh, I I primarily uh, missed... uh, just about the entire show. The only thing that it sounds like uh, was being talked about was uh, uh, Mr. Flood, Kurt Flood. Uh, uh, I, I, I remember hearing you saying something about uh, that uh, he most of the, most of the interview was over a book that he wrote on Kurt, Kurt Flood. Is that correct? Uh, that was kind of the central uh, theme of the book. We did talk about uh, what mm-hmm. happened with Richard Sherman and. Uh, a few other sports-related incidents with racism as well, but that was kind of the the central theme was uh, Kurt Flood, Jackie Robinson, I guess as well. Okay, just like just like anything else in this part of the world, uh, a non-white black person uh, essentially takes the lead on anything that that can be considered to be uh, something that uh, is is pointed towards a system of justice. Uh, uh, and in this case, uh, from my understanding about Mr. Flood, uh, incredibly, uh, uh, courageous person who literally put his, uh, his, uh, 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 quality of life on the line, uh, uh, to, for, for something that's pointed towards a system of justice. And, uh, so I, 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 you know, once I saw a documentary, and uh, read something on him. Uh, that that was uh, it. Was always uh, you know I, I'd hold him high as far as being a very courageous uh, a person. And uh, it's, it's it's not unusual. Uh, Correct for did, did did he mention anything about that? Right after Kurt Flood uh, made took that risk, uh, and it went all the way to Supreme Court. That uh, when it was challenged again, being that he kind of like cracked the wall, so to speak. Uh, that two white males actually won the uh, the uh, the free agency uh, uh, situation, and uh, it was actually uh, two white males who gained, who first gained the advantage of this what we what, what they call today the free agency. It, it, uh, did he mention anything about that? It is in his book. Uh, I don't think we uh, broached that part on the program, but it's in his book repeatedly, and he talks about how a lot of people yeah. uh, looked at that as another aspect uh, of racism, where this Mr. Flood uh, did all of this work, uh, didn't get right. any money out of it, wasn't compensated, right. and then these white guys come along, and they get to be the ones that actually reap the benefits and are credited as being the first uh, pro baseball players to become uh, what they call now yeah. free agents. Yeah, because some people equate uh, his his uh, loss, of, loss of health was due to uh, Due to his his courageous uh, uh, activities, uh, that it that it really, you know, got got the best of him. You know, uh, of course, you know when when you're doing what he what he did, it, it's this incredible uh, feeling of loneliness. You know, because most people are not willing to take that risk. I, he 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 had uh, a lot of non-white supporters. But they would come around, you know, when when the coast was clear, and you know, hey, I wouldn't do that, but but thank you, <laughs> you know, so to speak, you know, that type of thing. And uh, like I said before, uh, from my understanding, he uh, really, really uh, put his 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 quality of life on the line because he he, he was he was, from my understanding, was one of the top baseball players at that particular time, mm-hmm. and and was. Uh, uh, as far as salary wise, his salary was pretty high. But from the standpoint, uh, 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 which is different from the day, uh, he was willing to put all of that on the line for what he thought was was correct. And uh, I think one of the one of the uh, uh, strategies to to kind of like uh, discourage more Kurt floods 
is these escalating salaries that that uh, uh, these athletes are making nowadays uh, that they can make with their with their job as a uh, 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 athlete or the endorsements and whatnot, and and uh, it kind of like puts a mute button on on, on their uh, their uh, 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 verbal. Uh, and in physical activities, you know, uh, uh, because they want to, you know, maintain that. But although in the long run, it doesn't show that none of that have any any long term dividends to themselves individually. When you see the number of these guys, these uh, athletes who are coming up uh, filing for bankruptcy, uh, the the numbers of uh, uh, homes. Uh, home life, home lives that are in disarray, uh, you know, uh, and, and all sorts of problems that these these uh, athletes have, uh, you know, uh, that they haven't shown any dividends to them individually, let alone talking about us collectively as uh, non-white black victims of, of racism and white supremacy. You know, so, but uh, nevertheless, I think that, ha- that plays a part in there not being uh, uh, people like uh, Jackie Robinson, or or Kurt Floods, you know, uh, or Jim Brown. You don't you don't see them uh, because of you know I, I think because of some of those reasons you know about the escalating salaries and and all of the the, the little fringe benefits that that uh, that comes along with being a very popular uh, quote unquote celebrity and or entertainer. And I'll, I'll listen to some other people. Uh, five, <clears throat> five, three, two, one. Did you have any comments or question? Yes, yes, I do. Um, I just heard that uh, Jonathan Martin interview, and he said that he doesn't know what he'll do without football. I really hope someone close to him lets him know that you really need to think about life after football because I just have a feeling that the whole football league and the only owners, which are racist suspects, might try to do something to keep him out of the league because I guess he spoke out against he spoke up against racism. So I really hope he thinks about life after football and has some has a future plan in place because this is how they operate: racist man, racist woman. <clears throat> you speak up against it, they will try to they will want to quote unquote put you in your place for doing so. And it's unfortunate, but he should be aware of it. It's just my opinion. I think it would be difficult at, at best for him to even uh, re-enter as a player in the National Football League. And that's at best. It would be very, very difficult because he, he would have problems uh uh, in the uh, inter interaction with uh, uh, the uh, players, and that's on any any team. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it, it'd be very difficult at that best. And probably mostly with the non-white players too. Oh yeah, yeah. I, that's, I, I'm, I'm I'm including that too. Uh, <laughs> you, you see signs of it even even with the Miami Dolphins. You see signs of it. So the honorary niggers. As they were calling this guy, he was like an honorary nigger. Like, yeah. <sighs> yeah, I guess I guess that's the raw raw version of it. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's the raw version of it. Uh, you know, as far as they're concerned. But uh, uh, and and unlike unlike a Jim Brown, who I who in my in my opinion was the greatest football player who ever lived, but he didn't he didn't limit himself to to being a quote unquote gladiator, uh, and and he developed. He developed so many other interests and also uh, connections with other people that uh, teammates that didn't necessarily like him or other players uh, they couldn't they couldn't isolate him uh, in a in a in a similar fashion for mistreatment you know in in, in that particular way uh, and uh, but. As I mentioned before, I think I think the 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 uh, and the result of the the escalating salaries 
that these guys are making and all of this, all of the, the, the publicity now as being quote unquote celebrities, uh, because the, you know the cameras and the whole idea of the National Football League is is a, uh, a a business. It's probably one of the most most uh, uh, functioning businesses in the world. Uh, it's more than just uh, your dad or or your brother watching the games. Now everybody are, are watching the games or have interest in professional uh, 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 football. Uh, that uh, it 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 gives a whole lot of other non-constructive alternatives out of the employees that play the game. Uh, and and they, get in, they get involved in all kinds of mess, all kinds of foolishness. Uh, and it's not a surprise that, especially with the, uh, and I'm, I'm only concerned about primarily the non-whites, the non-whites who, who are employees and, and, and non-white black males, and primarily on the other end coming out, it's, it's very little to show for. Very little to show for on the other end. Uh, you know, so uh, the moment you the moment you sign a contract, you better be making an exit plan at the same time. Okay. Um, can I can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. I can, I can hear you, ma'am. Okay. Um, yes. Greetings to all. What I was going to say in regards to um, Jonathan Martin being white bald because that's exactly what it is. He's going to happen to him because it's going to be very impossible for him to ever. In the locker rooms, you're all going to be looking at him basically as a snitch and someone that they're really not going to feel comfortable even making a, a simple joke with him. So his career is pretty much a wrap. I would suggest his, his peers are pretty good. I think I believe it's, both of them are, are attorneys. And his degree that he received from Stanford, he, had, he needs to go ahead and put that to good use. Going to sports management or something like that since he likes sports so much. You should look at becoming a sport um a sporting agent. He his career will be much longer. He'll make a better um salary, and he um just move on from there. You know we need to stop trying to always want to be playing playing with a ball instead of sitting behind a desk and negotiating the contracts for these athletes to make sure that because all of these so called agents that you see on TV they're all white. Every last one of them, you see, you see, um, they're white. You don't see any 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 black ones. Jay-Z. I'm sure they have a few out there, but the ones that I've seen, they're always the white ones that you see at, at the table, at least the top agents. Jay-Z. So that is something that he needs to do. Jay Z is one exception. He's a sports agent. Well, Jay Z is a sports yeah. agent, but I don't believe Jay Z has any football players. What notable football he player he has? He has Kevin. Who? He's a basketball player, but he has Kevin Durant. He's uh, one of the best. Highest played uh, athlete. I mean, he's like Michael Jordan of this era. He's uh, he got he got one of the best you could get. It would be like LeBron James, Kevin Durant. They're like the top two basketball players in the world right now. He's uh, he signed with Jay Z. I think he just got, okay, he got Robinson, too. Yeah, Robinson Cano. Yeah, he got him a lot of money. Mister okay. Mister Johnny Cochran, before he transitioned, uh, uh, attempted to create a. Uh, a, uh, a, a team or group of of uh, non-white black people to uh, uh, become agents uh, in the. I don't know how successful it became, uh, but there are some. There are some uh, uh, black people who who have gotten into that that uh, uh, industry uh, uh, when it comes to athletics. Uh, uh, they, they have, they have been, you know, some. Uh, I, I was in agreement also with the with the, the contrast. I think Gus that you brought up with the the contrast with uh, homosexuality. If that was the the the, the, the uh, 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 subject matter, that it would it would would have been a much more of a uh, of a uh, 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 negative look at uh, Mister Incognito. Uh, as opposed to uh, what's going on now, uh, to where it's, I, and I've been I've been listening to all of the the, the quote unquote talking heads on the sports programs, and with this latest uh, situation with uh, the interview, is that uh, I don't I don't see anybody as far as in in, in support of 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 this uh, this young man, <laughs> you know, <laughs> at all. 
you know, it, uh, white and non-white, as far as that concerned, that actually it, it's, it's in support, you know, of it. And, and it's obvious that, that uh, 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 Richie Cognito is, is a racist. Uh, but you, don't, don't, you, you, you hear very little about that uh, at all, and, and most of the criticism is on, on Jonathan Martin. The victim. I had a white coworker call him a racist. Was it a white person or a non-white person? A white person. Oh, they called, <laughs> called him a racist. They called incognito yeah. a racist? Oh, okay. That's yeah. like, right on, right on. <laughs> the person uh, that dialed in at 0748-0748, your line is open too. I just uh, wanted to get in really quick. Uh, the article, because he mentioned that ESPN, they were talking about this uh, today, the Richie Incognito, Jonathan Martin thing, which they do. It's on the front page. Uh, they have a poll on that's connected to this article, and the article is Richie Incognito Lawyer says text sent by Jonathan Martin of Miami Dolphins just as vulgar. Uh, the poll is who is most to blame for the Richie Incognito Jonathan Martin situation? Richie Incognito Jonathan Martin, Dolphins leadership coaches. Almost 40,000 people have voted. Whom do you think is least to blame? Cognito. Cognito and the Dolphins. So that, that's, the, that's the question is who's the least? The question is whom is most to blame? And then they cite the three parties. He's going to be Martin. He's going to be the victim. I would say say they would be voting for Martin. (laughs) (laughs) He's the one to blame. The person that they have is... the team team player. (laughs) uh, Surprisingly, the person they have is most to blame is Dolphins leadership and coaches. That's what I thought, too. Uh, And then second most to blame is Richie Incognito. Least to blame is the victim, Jonathan Martin. But it's close. It's close. That's good. That's a change. I was surprised, too. I was surprised, too. Uh, I I have a quick question. I have a question. Oh, um, like that that word bully, did he, did um, Jonathan Martin himself, did he say that he was bullied? Like, did he say that word? Because, oh, like, I'm trying to figure out, like, because I know when they first started talking about that story, they was using the term bullied, and I think the word hazing. Right. Like, and I'm trying to figure out, like, was he saying the words himself, or did they kind of, like, plaster that word so they can try to make it seem like, oh, um, well, he's, like, a 400-pound lineman. He can't defend himself, and... He shouldn't be a victim of bullying. So that you know, like how they can try and spin that in the media, right? Yeah. The quote that they have here, it has him using the word hazing. Now I don't know if that when it first came out, because I mean months ago, I don't know if that was the word he was using then was hazing. Uh, and then once it hit the media and white people started talking about it, if they switched it and started saying bullying, or uh, if they were using both of them. But the quote that's in front of me now, he's saying hazing. Um, but I would have to go back to look when it first broke to see what word was being used, if it was hazing or bullying, or he might not have even been using either one of those. I've always thought that the word nowadays is, is overused, the word bullying. It's, over, it's, it's very much overused, in my opinion, as compared to uh, what it was thought to be, let's say, 40, 50 years ago. I mean, uh, just just, just a, a few weeks ago, uh, one of my son's teachers accused him of being a bully to her. You know, I mean, it just, it, 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 it just, in other words, in this case, it, it, it's a substitute in my mind for, for a, 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 a uh, white person practicing racism uh, against a non-white person in, 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 the, in the workplace. You know, I mean, we, we have, we have this discussion uh, at least once a week, you know, workplace racism. And, and this is not a, a primary example of it, <laughs> you know, if something's wrong with me in my mind, my thinking, Absolutely. you know, and I mean, and they, they, and and one thing about it that 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 uh, I hear also, they try to make it seem like the, the 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 football locker room is so different than any other job. I mean, I worked on I worked on on a job for twenty seven and a half years uh, on the fire department that's 
just like the lock, uh, the, the Dolphins locker room. There's nothing that they talked about that you, any one of us has heard that didn't take place in a fire station on a, on a daily basis. On a daily basis, you know, as far as they're concerned. You know, like, including, including plenty of rich incognitos. You know, <laughs> they're right. Because it, 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 somebody was talking about, well, he can't do anything else. It, it, something wrong with that because a lot of them have joined, gotten jobs on the fire department. That's for damn sure. You know, <laughs> you know. So I mean, I don't, I don't see where there's a difference. And, I, and I've, and I've cohabitated in, in, in both environments. You know, I, I played uh, high school and college football myself. So it's, it's no, there's nothing, you know, really foreign about that. What, what I wanted to hang um, on for a second. I wanted to make sure Lash has got her uh, question in. Lashes, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to know, did the guests talk about the relationship between metaphors and rhetoric at all? We didn't spend as much time on uh, his field of rhetoric as I would have liked, because that's not what I wasn't at. That wasn't even what I was asked to have him on the program for. He was recommended under the uh, topic of the sporting thing. But, yeah, that's something I would I would love to have him on to or another person in that field, another white person in that field to spend more time to talk about that. Okay, thank you. What I, what I wanted to, um, to ask in saying with what the Kurt Flood, going back to Kurt um, Flood and what he has done and the people who have benefited, and as the other caller said, it's always us. We, we, we are always the trailblazers that have to go out here, do all the heavy lifting, and then everyone else come in and they just sit back and enjoy the feast after you have done all of the hard work. Because you can look and see at Major League Ball or um, Baseball, it's it, it's not as heavily black as it is. You know, if they want to include the Latin Americans and the Caribbean ball players on the team, then they can say that. But the majority of the players now, you, you are hard pressed to find a black ball player from the United States. They have slowly whittled them out of the league. So it, 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 it's, you're seeing a lot of Asians coming in from Korea, China, Japan. They're bringing those in. And, of course, the ones that they're recruiting from the Central, Central America, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, those regions. You're seeing lots of those are in there. And, of course, they're, they're not going to get on the black side of, about anything if there's any kind of contract negotiation, negotiation management thing because they're trying to protect their best interests. So with Jim Brown, um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and all of these other people, Muhammad Ali, all of them who have done so much for the game, we are once again relegated to position of, of irrelevance, which is why I was kind of um, ticked at him when he was mentioning about these black players, whoever wrote that piece, who didn't show up for Mr. Flood's funeral. It's like, what happened to all of these white athletes? Because you said these two white players... Who won the judgment? Who were the first ones to, to, to benefit it from what Mr. Flood did? I hope they showed up at his funeral to, to at least say the man thank you. <laughs> that was uh, probably that did. was in the in the Houston Chronicle. Uh, I'm trying to give you the guy's name so you can uh, attribute your uh, correct and rightful uh, indignation at him. His last name is Chas. His first name is let's see if I can find it really quick. Uh, but it's in the you can I can even see if I can get it online. It's in the Houston Chronicle uh, where they were doing the uh, elegy for uh, Kurt Flood, and uh, he had all this to say about all these black athletes who didn't show. Which, that's even one thing that I appreciated in the book is that he uh, rebuts a lot of the people who just spend all their time complaining about. Uh, whoever, Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods or Shaquille O'Neal and saying, oh, you all don't get out and, and do this and do that and how easy it is to sit around and criticize them and not looking at why the greater fact is as to why that is that these people aren't doing all of this and even the people that often get cited for speaking up and saying things that they face a lot of the same criticism that you hear now uh, way back when. Uh, but his last name is Chas. I'll see if I can find his first name. Uh, Mr. Reed, Black Talk Radio founder, did you have a comment you wanted to get in? Yes, I wanted to get a comment. Um, Dennis Rodman came up um, doing, uh, earlier in, in the program, and I was wondering if anybody saw the interview that uh, Jay Leno did with Magic Johnson and how uh, Jay Leno, racist suspect, was able to um, solicit an attack on Dennis Rodman from Magic yes. Johnson. Did anybody see that? 
No, no, I did not. But I saw mm -hmm. what Kenny Anderson on Pierce Morgan and a few others, and how they brought out all of these big guns to try and do Dennis in. Mm. Yeah, Dennis is, is the target of, I would say, state-sponsored propaganda efforts right now. Um, now, contrast that with the interview, and, and I would say, you know, in codification terms, that Richard Sherman uh, displayed better codification uh, uh, than Magic Johnson did. Uh, Skip Bayless in the interview with um, Richard Sherman, and I think this was before you know, the little brouhaha, um, you know, little about nothing of the interview, post-interview, uh, post-game interview he gave during the NFC Championship. Well, Skip Bayless tried to bait Richard Sherman into attacking um, the black cornerback, uh, Revis, uh, was it Darrell Revis? Okay, and, and yeah, Darrell Revis. And Richard Sherman wouldn't go for it. Richard Sherman was like, I don't have nothing to say about him. And I'm paraphrasing. I don't have anything to say about him. Uh, my numbers speak for myself in terms of who's the best cornerback in the NFL. And I, I was really, you know, took note of how Richard Sherman would not attack this other black player um, being baited by Skip Bayless, a, a very, I wouldn't even call him a racist suspect. I would call him a racist just because I've known of his work and commentary for quite some time in the arena of sports. But um, Dennis Rodman is a target right now because, you know, North Korea is on the enemy's list, um, has been so long for going all the way back to Bush. I think Bush named them in their axis of evil. And so, you know, Dennis Rodman has been, and I thought Dennis Rodman handled himself quite well. The first thing in the media I saw was the interview on a Sunday he did with George Stephanopoulos. And George Stephanopoulos tried to play like, you know, play Dennis like he was dumb and he wasn't aware of things that's going on in the world. And so uh, he's going to tell Dennis, oh, are you aware of this report that says that, you know, uh, North Korea has prison camps? Uh, and, and so Dennis Rodman said America got prison camps, you know. And America locks up more people than far, far, far more than North Korea, okay. Uh, even um, Louisiana alone. Um, has the largest prison plantation or, or population in the world, seven times that of China, and China got a billion people, all right? And so I just was very disappointed um, in Magic Johnson's response in attacking Dennis Rodman. Uh, words were put into his mouth, though. I mean, if you pay attention to Jay Leno, I know it's supposed to be entertainment or whatnot, but that guy, it really, you know, is a state propagandist for the United States of, of America. I mean, you know, he put words in the Johnson's mouth. Oh, what about our friend Dennis Rodman of uh, the pathetic display? And, and then, you know, you could tell that he was leading um, Magic Johnson to say what he said. And then um, I was disappointed in Magic Johnson's racist joke about, you know, North Koreans being short. You know, this is a basketball game. Dennis' team should have won. Um, you know, they're only this tall. You know, th that's a stereotype of North Koreans. And I mean, to, for that to come from a non-white person as much as we are stereotyped, I was very disappointed in that. But I lay all the blame on Jay Leno. Jay Leno set him up for that. But again, Magic Johnson is no dummy. Um, but, you know, he is a big business mogul, mogul and he depends on people, you know, um, uh, patronizing his businesses and things of that nature. So, yeah, I just thought that was pathetic and wonder if anybody had, had seen that attack on Dennis Rodman by Magic Johnson, uh, initiated by the racist suspect, Jay Leno. And I mute my mic. No. I heard the, I heard the accounts of it through various uh, uh, sports. Sports uh, uh, programs, uh, on, and, and I think Mr. Reed was very accurate on on uh, his his analysis of of, of that. Uh, it just sure, then. How how manipulative uh, white people are, and it's it's, it's actually it's a it's the old strategy to be able to get uh, one non-white person to to uh, say something negative. Uh, uh, Divide and conquer. About another, yes, 
uh, Warren Sapp is involved in something like that uh, right now also. Uh, uh, Ex-football uh, player in the National Football League just became a, a NFL Hall of Famer, and it, it, they got this back and forth between himself and... Uh, Michael Strahan. Uh, yes, yes. And, and primarily Michael Strahan uh, is... Uh, uh, from from my understanding, from listening to a lot of white people, it's kind of like a a, a favorite. Uh, he he gets on programs other than sports related, that sort of thing. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, he does. Really show. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he's he's just a really in place. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A lot of times, a lot of times, you know, the non-white black person could get could get unfocused, unfocused, uh, and get caught up into that, and we 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 end up going at one another. You know, it goes back to that what Mr. Fuller said on how we we've been we so full of toxin, and, and, and it actually becomes an enjoyment to do so uh, because of our lack of discipline, our lack of uh, focus on, on, on what really the problem is, and uh, it's something that 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 unfortunately, you know, that but it is it is workable. We could work on it and and and, and rid ourselves of that toxin if we work hard enough at it. Yeah, one one uh, last observation on that interview with Jay Leno. It's posted to TMZ. Um, yeah, you can find it on TMZ. And there's another website. I can't remember the name of it. They got the video, too. But it's in TMZ Sports. And I imagine it was last night's program that uh, Magic Johnson was on. But the other thing that, that kind of stuck out to me that Magic Johnson said was, you know, saying that, you know, what's pathetic about Dennis going over there is you don't go over there when they're trying to harm us. And I'm yes. saying, who is us? You know, right. Magic, who wow. is us? You know, I am not uh, United States, so don't put, you know, Scotty Reed in us. How are they harming us? You know, the people I see harming us is us, meaning U.S., meaning United States. So I, I was like, wow, Magic, you know, and, and Magic's an intelligent person, and so he was probably just doing the politically correct thing and saying what they wanted him to say so he doesn't suffer on the plantation. Well, the case with Magic and his son coming out of the closet, as well as his affiliation with all of these sports teams and business franchises, he, he is just doing, I guess, doing what he got to do. But as you said, he should know better. He's a businessman. He knows better. CNN is the worst of the lot because they, they drag Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. They brought all of these people they can get. Any black player who could stick a microphone in front of their faces, they brought him on to try and roll Dennis under the bus. And it was disgraceful. It was it was very, very disgraceful behavior. And Pierce Morgan was the worst because when I watched that Kenny Anderson interview, it, it, it made me mad because he was badgering Kenny, saying, well, are you going to give back all of the money? You need to give it all back. You should not keep any because it's blood money. You don't need to keep any of it. You need to donate it all to charity. I'm just saying, this is what the man do for a living. He, the, he said the North Koreans didn't pay him. So why should he take all of his money? Well, how much money did you make? It's, it's like, why are you all in my pocket? Oh, didn't he do that with, um, I think, Gaddafi's son? Like Beyonce, 50 Cent? Yeah. A lot of people have to give money back. Saying that it was wrong for them to take that money. Like taking he, blood money for I don't hear them telling Magic to give back the profits he made from uh, Starbucks when it's been documented Starbucks is among the corporations that use prison slave labor, um, you know, to make some of their products. But you see, when they, and, and the thing that really got me on is when, it's, it's on the interview with Pierce, they had this, little, this young white guy, look younger than both of my children, sitting up there as the agent for Kenny Anderson. And he's going to say, oh, when Pierce is going to ask him, well, well, what do you have to say about it? The agent is going to turn around and say, well, I wasn't even aware that Kenny was going anywhere. All I do was I looked at his tweet and he says, wheels up. And next thing I know, I saw he was in North Korea because if I would have known, I would have stopped him. I'm just saying, you know, here it is. You're a young guy. Kenny Anderson is a grown man in his 40s. You are his agent. You work for him. You don't. You can't stop your employer from doing anything. You can consult with him as his, as you, the agent and discuss with him if this is a good thing to do. 
But, but this is the racist attitude of these people to say, okay, well, what, what, I, what I'm going to stop this nigga from, from running out here and making a living. That, that's right. how it comes off. And they also blasted Dennis um, because there's apparently some South Korean who's in prison. I don't know the details on what he was accused of doing, but Dennis spoke on it and saying, I don't know. Dennis basically said, you know, he didn't really know, uh, but apparently he might have broke some of their laws. And so, you know, who am I to be telling them, let this mm -hmm. guy out of prison? And, and then, so again, you know, and, and Dennis, to me, is coming off being smarter than all of them. You know, he exactly. acknowledged that the United States is has prison camps. And and so, uh, you know, they want Dennis, a non-white person, to go over there and, you know, advocate for this person to be released because, you know, American government want him released. And, but yet the United States is holding all these political prisoners, most of them non-white. So I just want, I just had to interject because I'm totally got Dennis back on all of this. And it's just pathetic how they, he is being targeted right now. And this isn't just, yeah, this is state sponsored. Okay, this is full backing of the United States government, their propaganda, world propaganda efforts. And uh, thanks for letting me share. I'll continue to listen. Great point with that because the guy's name is Kenneth Bay. Is the um the, the, the South Korean that's that's over there, and my thing is that Jimmy Carter is doesn't want to get involved in this, and if Jimmy Carter is not going to touch this with a ten foot pole, why it is that you expecting Dennis Rodman, who is not a diplomat, who is not a former head of state, why is it you expect Dennis Rodman to go over there and do that? Dennis Rodman has been able to do what the State Department what. This administration, the previous administration, has not been able to do go and sit down and have a talk with a North Korean leader. He's been able to do that. But they over here want to be throwing darts at, at, at the man and saying all of these negative things just because they want to escalate a conflict again in that region. I think I read, uh, I read something on Yahoo about Kennedy. I think they say he's trying to bring Christianity over to North Korea. According to Yahoo, now if that's correct, then I mean, thank you. Yeah, you're trying to preach this racist white supremacy philosophy in North Korea, and they're like, okay, we gotta, we gotta do something about this. But I don't know how true that story is. So. They said he was a mission. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I was quickly. They said he probably was a missionary, but we know with missionaries how the government could use them as cointel pro to co up in there, go undercover as a missionary, but you really running the business like they do with all of these NGOs, they send them in, but they're undercover working for the CIA in order to do subversive action. So that's probably why he was found out, and that's probably why the North Koreans having him, holding him there as a prisoner. I mute myself. Now I just have one last thing, and plus he's a non-white male. So white suprem the white supremacists is pretending as if they actually care about this person. Now, if it was a white person, I think they, they may try to aggressively, like, pursue him to come back to the United States. But this is a non-white male, so they're, they're putting on the act of pretending as if they really care about his well-being when they really don't. So, that's Agreed. I uh, just wanted to get in uh, Warren Sapp. I think he was mentioned. I did see that. I think that happened over the last 24 hours or so where they were Another example of getting two victims of racism to fight and squabble uh, between each other. Right. I think we had a lot of examples of that in the program when he was talking about this happened with uh, Jackie Robinson and Minister Malcolm uh, and even Adam Clayton Powell being in it as well. Uh, and then Michael Strahan, Warren Sapp. Warren Sapp was also one of the ones who came out to defend Richie, uh, uh, Richie Incognito. Uh, and saying that he was an honorary black person and he called him a nigger and he didn't have a problem with it and all that. Uh, Warren Sapp is a victim of racism, but I think white people, uh, they are extremely keen. They know which victims would serve their purpose, which victims exactly. to put a microphone in front of your face. Uh, hey, we want to borrow you for a second, need you to talk about this, that, and the other. It even reminds me uh, when they got victim of racism, Charles Barkley, to come out after the Trayvon <laughs> Martin verdict and say that uh, you got a lot of black racists uh, and that they try to always make it seem like the racists are white people. And he said it twice for emphasis. You got a lot of black racists. I think white people are very skilled at knowing whom to give a microphone to and who to pull the microphone away from. Uh, I think Dr. Welsing, 
said that no one called her to do an interview after Trayvon Martin, but Charles Barkley, CNN, we want to hear what he has to say. They are extremely skillful, and hopefully all of us, uh, that's one thing we can do right there, just get in that habit of not talking bad about other black people. A microphone is ever stuck in your face, or you ever get interviewed or asked something you already know, I'm going to be on the lookout to make sure that they do not pull me to any trap to get me talking bad about another black person, even if I don't like them. I think, uh, as Mr. Reed said, even I think Richard Sherman did, a, and this was way before everything happened recently, uh, when he was on uh, First Take on ESPN, where they kept trying to get him to go at, uh, what is his name, uh, Revis, Daryl Revis. Uh, who's a black male, also a football player, right. where they kept trying to get him to go at him, and he absolutely refused. They kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it, and he would not take the bait. He would not say anything bad about He just kept talking bad about Skip Bayless. I mean, it was the greatest thing ever. Uh, you should just go and check it out. He just kept talking bad about Skip Bayless the whole time. They even had to get the uh, non-white co-host, uh, Stephen A. Smith, to pull him off of uh, Skip Bayless because he just kept going at him. Uh, we should uh, – I'm sorry? That gives me that gives me evidence for once again that white people are not unaware about yep. their, their position in the system of racist white supremacy. That they're not ignorant. They know what strings to pull, what buttons to push on us, uh, 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 in and all times. They are they are very much aware of it on how they're able to manipulate us to to act on each other in that fashion. That just gives me more evidence. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I did post. Can I say one? La- I'm sorry. Go ahead. Can I can I say one thing? Because yeah, I was talking to a non a non white black coworker the other day, and he, we were just we were just having like general conversations because you know we talk sometimes we speak about racism and things like that just because we have a rapport. And he mentioned that a white a white a white person a white coworker came up to him and they have a small talk. He was like, yeah, the the, the guy brought up was like, oh. So what do you think about the Super Bowl? So the what? So the non-white black coworker said nothing. And he said the guy looked like he he didn't know what to do after he heard that comment. And so he said he said he said he said I had to I threw him a life raft and just kept it kept it going and said you know what well, you know if certain people if this was certain people that enjoyed the Super Bowl then I'm pretty sure they'll be into it. But he was like. It kind of left them, it left, it left the white person something to think about next time he wants to come up to him. And you know how they like to talk to every black person or every non-white, specifically non-white black person about sports and things like that. So kind of caught him off guard and let him know that. Watch what you say. Think before you speak sometimes. Like, everybody's not, everybody's not going to talk about sports, especially on the non-white black side. Uh, I think that's something I could take, you know, as a mental note. And being codified, you know, and responding to the racist comments, regard, racist questions regarding sports and things like that. True. Uh, we did our three hours uh, and a little overtime. Um, I did get asked via email about the our guest, Dr. Khan, uh, his racial classification, because I asked him uh, quite a few questions to get to. Uh, if other people see him as a white person and how he classifies himself. I think the, finally he said that on their forms, he checks the box that is closest to multiracial, uh, if that's available. Uh, I have seen a photograph of him. It's on his webpage on the University of South Florida's website. If you want to check him out just from looking at him, I don't think, uh, or I'll put it this, I think a significant chunk of white people would not accept him as white. Uh, he doesn't look like Lil Wayne. He doesn't look like Dick Gregory or anything. But I don't think uh, a majority of white people would accept him as being a white person, particularly once they hear his name. Uh, I think he would have some uh, some difficulties uh, being accepted. Definitely not seen as a black person. But uh, and I think he did say at the beginning. I think he said he checked the box that was closest to quote unquote uh, multiracial, whatever that means. Uh, he didn't say he checked the white box. Um, at any rate. Uh, we should be back tomorrow. Uh, I think the book that he mentioned that I wanted to check out is, uh, if I got it correct here, uh, yeah, it's Damien L. Thomas uh, and his book on uh, Globetrotters and how black athletes and entertainers are used, uh, where white people ship them around the world when they're trying to manipulate 
uh, global affairs and what have you, things that are happening in other parts of the world. Uh, he's yep. a black male. Uh, we'll see if we can get him on the program. He's at the University of Maryland. Wow. Uh, his name is Damien L. Thomas. Damien L. Thomas. Uh, you can check his book out online. Hey, um, Gus, that, that um, lady you had on your show, one of um, I think she's a musician that was married to um, a white person. She said she was used as one of those global ambassador. I believe she played in a... I'm trying to think of her name. I think she's from Boston. Carolyn, uh, is it Wilkins? She was on pretty recently. Yeah, yeah, she was on about four or five months ago. Her husband, she they were both in musicians from Chicago. Played at, Her parents started at some black schools that were born out in the Midwest. Yeah, Carolyn, I'm just... Trying to make sure I get her last name correct. Uh, she was on in uh, November. Uh, Carolyn, since I get my iTunes to open. Okay. Uh, Carolyn. I think she was on in October. Oh, it was November. It was November uh, when she was on the program. Carolyn okay. Wilkins, I was right. Pat, okay, uh, yes. What I said, <laughs> Carolyn Wilkins, yeah. She was on yeah, the, I remember uh, her. I think, I don't yeah, know. I remember her mentioning that she did that as part of her musical um, routine. Yeah, I think she went to South America and some other, some other spots. I'm sure there are quite a few folks who have uh, been used in that manner. Uh, I think this is something white people have been getting over on for quite some time. Matt, I don't even, I think Magic Johnson probably has as well uh, with that. But anyway, we did our three hours. We'll be back tomorrow. We'll talk about this on uh, Saturday. Uh, Mandela, Madiba, Long Walk to Freedom uh, will be here tomorrow, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Invest if you think the program is constructive. Racism-notes.blogspot.com Racism-notes.blogspot.com PayPal is in the top right corner. Invest if you think the program is constructive. Uh, remember to share links to the programs, information if you think it would benefit other non white people to become less confused, more informed about racism, white supremacy. Uh, he gave a double negative on the program, too. I thought that I put an asterisk in for anybody who was listening. Uh, when white people give double negatives when talking about racism, I note that as important just because white people consistently comment on the importance of grammar and he is a rhetorician uh this is someone who studies language communication to purposely give a double negative uh unless it is really adding to clarity i think when white people do that and he's not even someone who i think uh, he said he didn't classify as white i don't think he'd be accepted as white but he does have a white parent uh, i think that is just the influence of having that white parent and the influence of likely Studying in a field where you're in contact with a lot of very refined racists, it's been my experience, they will do that and give a convoluted response as opposed to being as clear as possible. Because I think the way he phrased it was, uh, it is not unpredictable for white people to use a black person as a representative of some school of thought when they're trying to manipulate or encourage or persuade a non-white person to think a certain way, it is not unpredictable. That's the way he said it for them to use a non-white person. Uh, and it, in my mind, it would be easier to just say it is predictable that white people will try to use a non-white person symbolically to persuade or carry out certain deeds. That would be the most effective, the simplest, the clearest way to say it. And I think that is just it is uh, I would say it is almost default. I think that's one of those things that white people do it all the time to make sure they make it difficult for non-white people to easily grasp what racism is, how it works, and the different things that white people do to practice deliberately racism all the time. But purposeful double negatives, that's one I pay attention to. Anywho, creator, we ask that you help all non-white people minimize, abstain from being in conflict with talking bad about degrading going in public to defile verbally another victim of racism, non-white person. Help us to become disciplined, no matter what we think about that non-white person, to never 
publicly, verbally degrade another victim of racism. It always benefits white people when we do this, give us the strength and the discipline to remain codified on this every day at all times. This would deal a major blow to the system of white supremacy when it is known worldwide. Black people do not come out in public to talk bad about other black people. Victims of racism do not run to white people to gossip and talk down about another victim of racism. If it's any going to be, it's going to be any criticizing and talking bad. It should be directed at a white woman, a white man, a white child, all of the above. There should be infinite numbers of white people that we have bad things to say about before we get to any victim of racism. Help us remain patient with ourselves, patient with other victims of racism. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice as soon as possible. Context of white supremacy signing up. Thanks all for tuning in. I'm a victim, no brother. Problem. You're a victim. Uh, I'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned.